Shabbat Shalom, brothers and sisters. Thank you for joining me here today on Let's Talk Torah. It's such a privilege and honor. It's such a blessing to have you all with us today. So I thank you for joining us. I have a few people already in the comments. So I'd just like to say Shabbat Shalom to Asia. Thank you for joining us. So wonderful to have you. Between the River and the Ravens, Lee's lovely to see you. Shabbat Shalom. So today, my guest was supposed to be uh, Robert, but unfortunately, he's a bit under the weather. So I do have the privilege, though, of having James join me. So I will just get him on now. So I'd like everybody to give James a wonderful round of applause. Thank you very much. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you for having me. Oh, no, thank you for being here. Oh, Daniel, wonderful to see you, brother. Great to have you here. Jen, Shabbat Shalom. Good morning. Good morning to everybody in America. Have a love. I hope you have a lovely day here in the UK. It's towards the end of our Sabbath, so I hope you have a lovely day. Shabbat Shalom, daughter of Yahweh. It's great to have you with us. Praise Yah. Turn back to truth. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you very much. And Nina, as always, Shabbat Shalom. Wonderful to have you all here. Uh, we got the applause going. We got the applause from everybody. I, I, I forget about that. I just remembered. Then I got that applause. So I have to make sure I use it every week. And um, so yeah, so. You've probably seen James a lot this week. He's been very busy on many shows. So, fortunately, he was able to get up nice and early today to join us. Because I know there it's, um, what's it, 9 a.m. there for you at the moment? Yeah, still fairly early in the morning. Yeah, I think I'm usually just getting out of bed if, if I'm lucky at that time. <laughs> so, uh, so it's a blessing to have you with us. So, thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. I know I was out of town the other week and... Robert covered for me, so technically we're back on track with the, the schedule we started out on. So yeah. glad to be here and glad for the opportunity. Oh, no, it's great to have you. Thank you very much. Oh, Jennifer, thank you for joining us. Shabbat shalom. It's great to have you all here. It's so wonderful. It really is wonderful. Um, it's such an honor to have you with us. Um, such a blessing. So before we start tonight, I'd just like to do a prayer. Shabbat shalom, Jacumba. Thank you for joining us. So wonderful to have you with us uh, yeah, today. I think this week I'd like to start with a prayer. I know there's many of us that are feeling maybe under the weather, being hit by some things, and um, I feel like we just need to lift some people up in prayer. So if everybody would like to join me, we'll just begin by having a prayer, then we'll jump into the Torah portion. Our Father, our Abbi, our Yahweh Father, we come to you in Yahushua's name. We come to you humbly, in meekness, just exalting you, praising you, glorifying you in all your wondrous works. Father, we lift up all our brethren, all our brothers and sisters around the world to you who are being attacked at the moment, whether it be physically, whether it be spiritually, mentally. Father, we just lift them up to you and we ask that you renew them, you restore them, you bind them and stitch them back to good health. Just restore them, Father, in your word, in your truth, in your name, in your son, Yahushua. Father, we just ask for that. We ask for that restoration. Father, we pray for all those that are in trials and tribulations. We just pray that you give them your covenant of shalom. You give them that peace and that comfort that you only can give. And Father, we thank you for this day, this Sabbath day, and this opportunity to have fellowship with our brothers and sisters from around the world. It is such a wonderful opportunity, and we thank you. We just ask that you dwell with us today. You fill us with your words and just let us speak your truth. And we ask all this in the name of your son, Yahushua. Amen. Amen. So thank you very much. So Shabbat Shalom, Dan. Good to have you here, brother. So today we have Torah portion, and I'll get it up now. And it is Ki Tetza. I think I'm saying that right. And it's Devarim, chapters 21, 10 through to 25, 19. I know James this week took the Half Torah and the Bessera. That was Isaiah 54, 1 through 10, and Luke 23, 1 to 25. Now, thank you very much. Amen. So this week, then, our layout that we will see, and we see in Deuteronomy, we just get so many things. Shabbat Shalom, Maka'el, it's great to see you. Hallelujah, indeed, brother. And Waxy DJ, Shabbat Shalom, it's, oh, we've got so many people here. It's, it's such a blessing. I, I really am so fortunate to have you here. And Pamela, Shabbat Shalom, good morning to you. I'm so, shouldn't say envious, but for you, just starting your Sabbath, it's just wonderful. You get to have that day ahead of you. We're at the end of our day, so I just hope you all have a wonderful day, and I'm so honoured to have you with us today. So, 
when we look at key tips, uh, the layout we have, and uh, we have many things in this Torah portion. So we begin by talking about the female captives when they go into the land and they, after war, we look at the right of the firstborn. We see rebellious children. We see some more laws and then laws concerning sexual relations. Those excluded from the assembly, sanitary ritual and humanitarian precepts. So we see about the cleanness there. Laws concerning marriage and divorce. We have some more laws. Uh, Le leave liverite marriage and we we finish with some more commands at the end so really as we have so much in this torah portion like i say deuteronomy is the name duo it's like the second law it's like the second reciting of the law in the greek the name it's given obviously in the hebrew it's devarim you know words but in the greek it's that second law and that's what we're going through and we just see we have so many in this so the name for the Torah portion this week is from the first words in verse 10, and it means when you go forth, ki tetza, when you go forth. And it consists of how to act and honor all life when you go forth. And it's not just in war, but in all aspects of our walk. So here it was when they were going forth into the land, into the promised land, which they were about to cross the yard and go into. Whereas for us, it's it's, it's every day in our walk. every Everywhere we go, we should be making sure that we are acting in honor to all life and i said this had many law commands in it and laws it's and we see it has 74 of the 613 laws throughout what we find in the torah so we can see there it's, it's over 10 percent just in this one torah portion just in these few chapters so there is so much to get through and these all instruct um and have instructors in having compassion and showing honor to yah by showing yah all his creation, his people, his animals, etc., showing that honor to them. So we respect, uh, we show your respect and honor by honoring his creation. And that's what we're going to see in this. And then we're going to see it's going to touch on all aspects of life. So on the next slide. So there's two words that make up this Torah portion. Key is the first one. And yeah, that means when. So that's where we get the when from. And you can see it's used as other words as well because of that. But here we have it for when and the second word is yatza it means to come out uh, to go out to come out exile to go forth and what's interesting here is that yatza is actually spelled with a yod but in this torah portion we see it's spelled with a tav you see it's spelled with a tav so when i was looking at this i thought maybe it's possible that's alluding to the covenant you know and that's how we we show honor is through the covenant and uh, show righteousness through yard's covenant so it's just just an interesting little thing there. We see instead of a yod, it's, it's spelt with a tav. So, like we're trying to do with all of these, we're just trying to break them all down when we start. So we see it's the calf. Begins there with that, remember it goes from right to left. We've got that open hand, the palm, uh, to allow or to tame. Then we have the yod, which is that arm or the hand, work, deeds, worship or praise. The tav, like we said, instead of the yoga, we've got that tav now, which is the covenant. It's the mark of the sign. It's those cross sticks. And uh, my wife, Catherine, spoke the other week about those cross sticks and how the tav is the last letter in, in the Aleph bet. And we think it's it, the, the Aleph bet ends with the tav, those cross sticks. And when we hear the prophecy of bringing those the two sticks together, I just thought that was wonderful when uh, Catherine brought that forward. It was so beautiful. Uh, Zadi is a man on a side, and it means desire, need, or journey. And the Aleph is the ox, strength, leader, or yar. So here I have two uh, two translations for this. I thought one is a picture of yar, uh, interpreted in, in the viewpoint of yar, and the other is for ourselves. So first we have, through his palm and works, the covenant was established by the desire of yar. And we see that picture of Yaki Shah that through, through that, nail driven through his hand on the tree and through his works the covenant and it was yours desire to have that covenant that covenant renewed for us i thought that was wonderful colossians 3 23 and whatsoever you do do of all your hearts as to yahweh and not unto men amen that is so wonderful and it's so uh, fitting for this torah board so i thank you so much for that door of yahweh it really is you know we should we shouldn't be doing acts for the men but we should be doing it to to praise and honor yah Oh, thank you very much. Turn back to truth. And my wife, Catherine, always says to me is, um, 
you know, when, when, whenever I have to go to work and I don't feel, you know, don't feel up to it, don't feel 100%, don't feel like giving my all, she says, you're doing it for your, you're not doing it for, for um, your employer, you're not doing it for your manager who may you know, not treat you the best, who may not listen to you. She says, you, well, when you go to work, you're doing it for your, so make sure you give it your best. And I feel like that just fits wonderfully with what you just said there, daughter of Yahweh. It's such a, such wise women we have on this walk with us. I know that if it wasn't for Catherine, I'd be going right, left and everywhere, but she keeps me focused. So I praise you all for that. And then the second one, when I looked at this, is that we open the way through our works and praise to the covenant on that journey to Yah. So through our work and our praise, so praising Yah and, and our work on keeping the commandments. We know it's through Yahusha that we're all saved, but we still have to have that will and that desire, that want to do the works and keep the commandments. And we establish this covenant on that journey to Yah. And that's what we're all trying to do. We're all trying to, we're all on this path on a journey to Yah. Amen. Thank you very much, daughter of Yahweh. Oh, yeah. Thank you, John. Yeah, turn back to truth. So great to have you with us. It really is a blessing for so many people to be here. So now then, we will jump into the Torah portion. Now we like to do these, uh, do the intro. Like I say, we've got a lot to get through today, so I I pray you're able to stick with us. Um, these in Deuteronomy really do become so full. So we'll begin now in verse 10 and 11. When you go forth to war against your enemies, and Yahweh Hekah has delivered them into your hands, and you have taken them captive, and see among the captives a beautiful woman have a desire unto her, and you would have her to be your woman. So Yah would allow the people to take women from the enemy as wives. You know, we see this with Samson or Shimshon. In Judges 14, we read of how he, he wants a daughter of the Philistines. It says, and he came up and told his father and mother and said, I've seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for my, to be, get her for me to wife. So we see here how Yah allows, seems to allow this, you know, taking a wife and a woman if we desire them from from these other nations however we are told that we should not be yoked with unbelievers so we must be careful second uh, corinthians 6 14 be unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion have light with darkness so when we do that though we have to be very careful and and yah will give um laws or, or stipulations requiring this taking a woman shabbat shalom gene and david it's such a wonderful pleasure to have you here that my my mum and dad in your so wonderful to have you with us such a blessing hope you have a, you've had a wonderful sabbath so verse 12 this continuing on from that then you shall bring her home to your house and she shall shave her head and pare her nails so this action of shaving was do i believe to represent her renouncing her religion removing any uncleanness and leaving their previous life. So like I said, when we take those people, we're not to be unequally yoked with them. They're to be renouncing um, those previous ways, those pagan ways, those other false religions that they followed. And we see this represented through this shaving of the hair, removing of the hair to removing themselves of, of those practices. Um, these were actions that were to, that were partaken during times of mourning by the other nations. We read that in Deuteronomy 14, that when they would mourn, sometimes they would shave their head. However, this is not uh, in representation of that act. It's more seen as purifying themselves. So I just wanted to put that in there because we may have some people that say, you are told us not to act as the nations and shave and head. And then he's telling them here to shave the heads of their wives. I believe it's more sort of this purification process to remove all uncleanness from them. And we also see this in Acts 21, 24. Take them and purify yourself with them and be at charges with them that they may shave their heads and all may know that these things whereof they were informed concerning you and nothing but that you will yourself also work orderly and guard the Torah. So we see this when they broke um, the commandments, when we they did something which may be unclean, they would shave them how to remove that and clean shave their head to remove that uncleanness from them. Again, we see this purifying. So that was to happen when they would take a wife. 
and she shall put the raiment of her captivity from off her, and shall remain in thine house, and bewail her father and her mother for month, and after that thou shalt go into her, and be her husband, and she shall be thy wife. So here we see that compassion of Yah. We see him allowing them or her to mourn for a month. She was to be taken away from her family, and in those circumstances, they may have been killed in battle. So we see Yah having this compassion and this love in allowing them to have this time to mourn. Also, this time for them to get to know each other, you know, to, to build that relationship before they were to, to to lie with each other and to become man and wife. We see see there how other nations would just take a woman and, and that would be it. They'd be seen as property. But here we're going to see in, in many more verses how Yah would, doesn't see the woman as property when when you take a in, to respect them and honour them. Um, like I say, again, showing Yahweh's character of compassion love to all life and this is something we see with yahushua when he healed people many verses we see in the brit hadashah the new testament when when yahushua heals he has that compassion so mark 1 40 and 41 and there came a leper to him beseeching him and kneeling down to him and saying unto him if you will you can make me clean and yahushua moved with compassion put forth his hand and touched him and said unto him i will be clean Yahusha, in this now in, in Mark 6 34, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion towards them because they were a sheep, not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And in Luke 7 13, and when Adonai saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the coffin. And they that bore him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto you, arise. So we just see this compassion, and it's something that we've seen carried on with Yahusha. We see it with Yah, we see it with Yahushua, we just see this compassion, and that's what we are to have. We're to have this compassion for people. So verse 14 now. And it shall be, if you have no delight in her, then you shall let her go whither she will. But you shall not sell her at all for money. You shall make her merchandise, you shall not make merchandise of her because you have humbled her. So the captives are to be respected by their husbands when they are, once they're married. They're not to be seen as property, property. You know, this differs from many other religions that would put men above women. And especially when they took these captives from war, they would treat them as property. The women wouldn't have a say. They wouldn't have a voice. But we see it completely different here. If the man was to, to no longer want to be married to this woman, she wasn't to be property. She used to be her own woman. She used to... You know, not be sold to someone else or treated like a slave or a servant. We see in Genesis 2 24, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his woman, and they shall be one flesh. We see one. We see how they're on this level playing field. Men and women in, in the Torah, in the eyes of Yah, they have different roles. Men and women have different roles, but they're both equal. They're both on that same playing field. Men are not above women. Women are not above men. It's all equal. And we just see this love with you. And sometimes it's always construed and manipulated to say that men are above women. And that's what the Bible teaches. But it, it, it certainly is not. We just see it in scripture. It's just people don't like to look at the truth. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yah has that love and cares for all people, native born or not. I think that's wonderful. These are people that are taken captive during war. Uh, and we see how they have that honor and that respect and compassion for them. Colossians 3, 19, men, love your women and be not bitter against them. So again, we see that, that men are commanded to love our women, you know, not to be bitter against them, not to treat them like merchandise or property. And again, it's that mercy and compassion for all. So when we look at this word humble, because he humbled, you have humbled her, it says, now, the word for humbled is anna, and many of us may have come across this word a few times in our war. When we look at the Brown Driver Briggs definition, it is to afflict, to oppress, to humble, be afflicted, be bowed down. And this word is what is used for the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16.31. It shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you, and you shall afflict your souls by a statute forever. So this is a very much debated topic and um it's something that we'll talk about when we get to day of atonement because um there's a lot meant about what this word and uh, what this afflicting means to do to us 
but here we see it's used as humbling. They've, they've humbled or they've afflicted their women. So we're just not going to go into too much detail on that. When we break this word down, we see it's an iron. So it's that I, that watch, experience, to know. The nun is that seed or life, the air, the sun. And hey, we see that man with his arms raised. It's behold, reveal, or breath, or the ruach of Yah. So through experiencing, looking, watching the sun, Yahusha, and what he went through, all is revealed to us. And and that is what we get from this word, and that. Um, I say, we when we, we look on Yahusha and we, we see what he experienced, then it's revealed to us. And that's how we afflict and humble ourselves. I really know. And I know you spoke about that last week. Like I said, I had to stop watching your video on your show because, because it's so painful, you know, to see, to, to really know what Yahusha went through, which it's so, so painful. Um, every, every blow he took, um, it really is so humbling. Turn back to truth. John says, Galatians 3.28, there is neither Yahudi nor Yavani, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Yahusha HaMashiach. Amen, brother. We certainly are. We certainly are. And I, I just, I love those scriptures as well, because we like to told, people like to tell us that we're not Jews. The Torah is not for us. We're not Jews. But, but Yahusha, you know, he died for all people. To, to be saved and to turn to Yahuwah, died for all people. And and what people don't like to look at is when that northern northern when the northern tribes were taken away and sent off into exile, they didn't return. They went off and they went abroad. You know, um, Yasharel is, is is sprung is spread across all nations, but but Yahusha came to graft us all in. So even those that aren't. Um, from a tribe, are part of a tribe, and it's so wonderful. So thank you very much for that, John. It certainly does, Jennifer. It's so painful. It really is so painful to think about what Yahusha did for us. And I know it's something, and it's actually something we will look at in a bit, um, but I know James spoke about it a few weeks ago, about that that tolaf, um, that, that crimson worm, and how it's a picture of Yahusha, and, and James did a did a study on this on, on Mercy Poured Forth. I think that was your first Mercy Poured Forth, actually, wasn't it, James? Yeah, I think it was, yes. It's been yeah. a while now. <laughs> yeah, but it has, but it is, it's such a... It's, if you haven't seen it, make sure you check it out. It'll be, it'll be James's first one. It'll be one of the first Mercy Poured Forths that we've done on Heart of the Tribes. And it'll be on, on uh, Between the River and the Ravens as well. And it was just such a wonderful message. And it's just it just shows Yah's creation and how... Yah was at the beginning and, he, and everything is planned. And we see this picture of Yahusha and this crimson worm that held himself on to the, that holds himself onto the tree with love. And that's what Yahusha did. He held himself to that tree in love and he took every blow uh, for us. And really it is, um, it's so wonderful, but at the same time, like I say, it's so hurtful and upsetting to think about what he went through. Um, it's definitely a loving sacrifice Oh, amen. Yeah. Amen. How he went through that is, um, well, it just, like I say, just shows that love. It really does. So Deuteronomy 21, 15 now to 17. If a man have two women, one beloved and another hated, and they have borne him children, both the beloved and the hated. And if the firstborn son be, be hers that was hated, then it shall be when he makes his sons to inherit that which he has, that he may not make the son of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated, which is indeed the firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the son of the hated for the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he is the beginning of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. So here we look at the first one. So, oh, Shabbat Shalom, Sherry. Thank you for joining us. So again, here we see that another example of Yahweh's compassion, you know, if a son, if, if, if a son was born that was from a, a woman that wasn't loved, the father was to still have this compassion, this mercy, this love towards this firstborn and treat it as the firstborn and not neglect them. And we see this with, with Reuben. Um, hallelujah, Asia. Um, so the firstborn 
being the beginning of the strength of a man. We see this in Genesis 49, 3. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. And we see that Reuben, he wasn't born to the beloved. Um, he wasn't born to, to Yako's beloved wife. He was born in that first marriage, which he was tricked into. And he was to receive the firstborn blessings. However, he was to receive that, that double portion. However, it was through his unrighteousness. I know it's something that Shell and and, um, and your wife Leah have looked at in the, when they looked at the testimony of Reuben, that it was through his own acts and his unrighteousness deeds that he lost that blessing. We see this in First Chronicles 5. One, now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Yashorel, for he was the firstborn, but for as much as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given unto the sons of Yosef, the son of Yashorel. So we see how he lost that firstborn blessing because of his unrighteousness. So it can be lost. Um, so just an interesting point there. He suffered greatly for that decision. He did. No, he did, yeah. When you, when you look at that testimony of Reuben, you see how much he did. It was a very long time that he was suffering from it. So verse 18, if a man have a stubborn and rebellious son that will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother's, and that when they have chastised him will not hearken unto them. So here I'm just going to break it down before you look at the next verse. So here we have two words, stubborn and rebellious. So stubborn is sarah, uh, samak resh resh. Um, we see here to turn away, you know, backslide and rebellious, revolter, stubborn. So we see that there in that word. And then in Mara is a word that we've come across a few times, rebellious it is. It's translated here, but we see bitter. You know, when we think of uh, the book of Ruth, um, Naomi changed her name to Mara because she's now bitter. So it's the same word there, that Mara. Um, to be disobedient, to disobey, provocation, provoke, rebel. So... So this is and this is the word that's used to describe the people in the wilderness when they provoked Yah. So we see this this stubbornness and this rebelliousness, this bitterness, this this disobedientness, provoking, and that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about children that really have turned away from Yah, from listening to their father and their mothers. Um, and we're just going to look at now what that turn leads into, which we see in the next verse. So verse nineteen reads. Then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out into the elders of his city and into the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of the city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Which is quite interesting. We'll look at those next. And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shall you put evil away from among you. And all Yashrael shall hear and fear. So we see that all the men of the city were to stone this disobedient child. We see it as a community. It's a community issue to help resolve these problems, this wickedness that comes through. And that's what we should be thinking of, really. We shouldn't be thinking that we're to deal with our personal issues alone, but we're to be a community to help lift each other up. We are all brethren in Yahusha, and we should be constantly looking to help one another in removing any wickedness from our lives. So we see it's the first Thessalonians 5.11, wherefore comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even also as you do. Now, I'm not saying if we have issues, we go and stone people that our issues are with. But what I'm saying is that, you know, we can have loads of aspects of our own life, which we need to need to really remove. You know, we have issues of the flesh, which we need to crucify daily. And we do take those things to yard. But as well, we do have a community. We are all brothers and sisters and we should all be there to help each other, to help lift each other up, to help people when they're going through problems. We should all be there for one another. And we see this here that how it was the community, the, all the elders were there to help him removing or, or stone this son. But when we think of it, maybe in a symbolic sense or it representing the, the inner wickedness and the inner, rebel, inner rebellious we have in ourselves, we can use everybody to help us edify ourselves and, um, and really overcome. Well, when, it, when it mentions child, you know, I don't think they're referring to a 10 year old no, or yeah. more so a, a young adult that has rebelled and just will not listen to his his parents. Yeah, definitely. Especially when you see glutton and drunkard. But yeah, no, uh, 
I've got I've got a two year old at the moment that's telling me no. <laughs> I wouldn't be thinking of taking her out. No, not at all. But yeah, great point just to clarify that. Yeah, we see this word child, um, you know, even when we're in our twenties, our thirties, our forties, we should still be listening and obeying and respecting our parents, especially if they're walking in Torah. We should still be making sure we listen to them. Um, absolutely, Nina, obey your parents for it is good. Absolutely. Asia says amen to that. We should be loving one another. Thank you very much, Lee. We should be loving one another. Exactly what Yahusha was accused of. Oh, very good point, actually. Yeah, I missed that. Very good point. Um, thank you, Dora of Yahweh. That is a great point. That is such a great point to bring up there. Uh, really starting to see how the actions of one can have consequences for all the community and how we need to be building for one another, thinking of everyone, not just ourselves. Amen. Amen. And we, we've, I'm sure we all come across that where we have people that we believe are helping us or believe are there for us, but really they're just looking to get that upper hand to, to, to lift, exalt themselves at the expense of the people around them. Yeah. Amen. Cat. Absolutely. We should be looking, like we said here to edify one another. We should be helping one another. And I had found two verses that really back up the discipline, you know, y'all wants us to discipline our children to teach them, you know, at an early age, I thought these two verses out of Proverbs were very interesting. Of course, we know in today's society, discipline isn't always something that's done. And we can see the, the consequences of that. In Proverbs 13, 24, he that spares his rod hates his son, but he that loves him chastens him early. And in tw Proverbs 23, 13 through 14, withhold not correction from the child. For if you beat him with the rod, he shall not die. You shall beat him with the rod and shall deliver his soul from Sheol. No, amen. Thought those no. were interesting, but very valid points. You know, you're not going to kill him by, you know, spanking him or, you know, punishing him, but it will serve a lifelong lesson. No, absolutely. And, and, and you see it throughout um, all countries, especially Western countries at the moment countries that we live in and you live in uh, children are just left to do what they want and they and they parents aren't laying that discipline down they're not taking control of situations and they are being allowed to do exactly what they want uh, sorry waxy dj said honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which yahweh alaheka gives you from exodus 2012 amen it's we got that promise there with that command as well they are now sending people to prison. Yep. In Wales, there's a law, well, this is where me and Catherine live, where if you lay, um, say, if you, like you say, spank your child, that is now classed as assault and you can get arrested for it. <laughs> uh, door of Yahweh. So many times the Pharisee said she's tried to accuse Yahshua with his own law, using it where it fit their wickedness. We must be careful that it convicts us and not use it to accuse others. Amen. Amen. Yeah, we should be always be. Uh, looking at ourselves before we point the finger at other people. And the inner exactly, James, I hear from people in public schools that the teachers can't even discipline the students because it is frowned upon. Oh, yeah, and you see many videos in America where kids beat the teachers. <laughs> it's like they run the schools, they run the homes. Children really are taking... The discipline's gone, and they're just taking control of the situations they're in. They really are... Uh, they're out of control, and they say... Um, parents do that from those, what you read in them Proverbs, they chastise for love. We, we do it because we love our children. We want to, we want to deliver them. We want to save their souls. We want them to be good, uh, respectable, righteous people, to have honor for people, to treat people right, not just thinking in the flesh in, of themselves all the time, being lovers of themselves. And, and that's what those scriptures were saying, were showing what you said there. And that's why we do it. You just, it's out of love. We do these things. Lee says, I read that somewhere in the US, a child was removed from a family because the parents refused to let them change. You know, there's many examples of that where that's happening as well. And um, it's so wicked. And uh, it's the control has been taken away from the family. And it really is. It's um, 
it really is perilous times we live in sometimes, especially in some countries or some states in America. Jen says, nowadays they are doing just the opposite of what you are. They're doing. Absolutely, they've flipped it all. You know, good is bad, bad is good. So absolutely. <laughs> Amen, yeah, Asia. What's right is wrong and what's wrong is right is pure evil. It really is pure evil. Door of Yahweh, but not but we know, now live truly in the days where wicked is called good and vice versa. Amen. And we, we're all seeing that in, in every aspect of life. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil and put darkness for light and light for darkness and put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Amen. Amen. And we're just seeing it in so many things. It does as well. Yeah, we've seen so many. Jennifer says lack of discipline makes, child, makes a child insecure. And we're seeing such a rise even before lockdowns of um, like health, uh, mental health issues with children as well. And we, it's, it stems from home. It stems from parents not taking control. It stems from uh, not having a say in their lives, not, um, not protecting what they put in their eyes and their ears, what they're doing. And this world is just set up against us and our children. They want to, they want to convert our children into what they want into to mindless puppets or to i don't know i don't know it's just just it's just it's really as wicked so yeah, when there's in. no consequences you know what are you willing to do you know it's going to be taken up another level when you know you can get away with things that you normally shouldn't yeah it's just a terrible example for our children no it is i know when i was growing up it was it was kind of do what you want really um you know, and I know it's just amplified even more now, the days that we're in now. It really is. It's gone up a gear. So Daniel says, they gather themselves together against the soul of the righteous and condemn the innocent blood. But Yahweh is my defense and my Elohim is the rock of my refuge. Psalms 94, 21 and 22. Amen. Karen, and he shall bring upon them their own iniquity and shall cut off, cut them off. In their own wickedness, yeah, Yahweh uh, Hainu shall cut them off. Amen, brother. Thank you for them. Children don't know what they are anymore. They can do what be whatever, and it leaves them without direction. Absolutely, it does. We need to have that control. I believe it must be why the suicide rate is going up as well. When when children are left as well, not just children, but people are left without that direction, without that purpose in life, eventually they'll feel like, what's the point? And when they spend their times looking at technology and focusing on, on these fake worlds that I know that um, was spoken of a few weeks ago and walking in the word, when they, they look at these pictures of people on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, when they look at these fake lifestyles of people, they then believe they don't match up and what's the point in their life. And, and that's really is the beauty of when we, when we come to the truth of Yahweh. We come to this truth and we know that we are we are important. We were made for a reason. And it is it gives us that gives us that love inside that only Yahweh can give us. So the children that refuse to hearken to Yah's word, we see it leads them going astray and becoming here. We see them spoke of being a glutton and a drunkard. Amen, waxy DJ. There there really is, Jen. We need to be careful. So this word first for glutton is salal, and we see um, it says here riotous eater, uh, worthless or prodigal, vile. When we look at the word for drunkard, it's sabah, and we see that it, it says uh, become tipsy, a drunkard, um, a wine bibber. So it's possible. While I was looking at this, I was looking at his words. I, it was making me look at it in a spiritual aspect, as we know. That bread and wine both represent Yahusha and doctrine. John 6.35 says, And Yahusha said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger. He that believes in me shall never thirst. Matthew 26.27, He took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye of it, for this is my blood of the renewed covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So when I was, uh, when I was thinking of this, I was thinking that you know, when people do go astray, when they do not obey Yah, they can follow after and fill themselves up with these false doctrines. They can be gluttonous on these false teachings. They can be drunk on these false doctrines. Um, you know, so we must be careful that 
our children do not go astray into these falsehoods. Uh, and this was to be another example, an attempt to prevent this action being copied and spread around the community like a plague, putting away that evil from among them, you know, in killing this, in this, in this person who was rebellious. It was commanded for children to honour their parents as brought up before Exodus 20, 12. And uh, Proverbs 30, 17, the eye that mocks at his father and despises to obey his mother, the ravens of the valley shall pluck it out and the young eagles shall eat it. And again, was prophetic of how the children of Yashara would turn from Yahweh, our heavenly father. Isaiah 1, 2 says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For Yahweh has spoken. I have nourished and brought, brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. So we see how this would be prophetic of what was to happen, how these people would go astray from Yah. So verse 22. And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be to be put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but you shall in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is cursed of Elohim, that your land be not defiled, which Yahweh gives you for an inheritance. So we see that these events appear to be prophetic of Yahusha um, dying on the tree. Although he was sinless, without fault and not worthy of death, he would be used. Uh, he he was and the instrument he would would be killed and the instrument would be wood. So we see in nineteen John nineteen thirty one, the Yahudim therefore because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath for the Sabbath was was a high day. We saw Pilate that he may break that their legs may be broken and that they might be taken away. And then verse forty two, there lay that the Yahushua therefore because of the Yahudim's preparation day for the sepulchre was nigh at hand so we see here that they were to take him down and that's why we read that they were to go and break the legs and um, but when they got to Yahushua he was already dead so they didn't break his legs and they took him down that's when they buried him and Yahushua died that so we would re re we would be redeemed from the curse Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Mashiach has redeemed us from the curse of the Torah being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the other nations through Yahushua HaMashiach, that we might re receive the promise of the Ruach through faith. <laughs> Catherine says, that verse in Proverbs went down with all the, well with all the children. I bet it did. I bet it did. So now we're in chapter 22. So we've, we've looked at there now how the children should be honoring and respecting their parents. Uh, we see it and we've seen how the husbands were to respect um, their wives. And now we're going to go on and look here in chapter 22, verse 1 and 4. You shall not see your brother's ox or his sheep go astray and hide yourself from them. And you shall in any case bring them again unto your brother. And if your brother... Be not nigh upon uh, unto you, or if you know him not, then you shall bring it into your own house, and it shall be with you until your father seek brother seek after it, and you shall restore it to him again. In like manner you shall do with the ass, and you shall do with his raiment, and with all things that your brothers which he has lost and you have found, you shall do likewise. You may not hide yourself. You shall not see your brother's ass or his ox fallen down by the way, and hide yourself from them. You shall surely help them to lift them up again. So we see here now to do our brothers and our neighbours. And we see that we are instructed to show compassion towards our neighbour, showing them honour as well. Leviticus 19.13 says, You shall not, you shall not defraud your neighbour, neither rob him the wages of him that is hired. Shall you abide? With you all night until the morning and mark 12 31 says and the second is like namely this you shall love your neighbor as yourself there is no, none other commandment greater than these so we were to help our brothers if we see if we see that someone's lost something or we're, we're to take it we're to to keep hold of it we're not to take it for ourselves or just to, to leave it we're to take it we're to protect it until our brothers come back and we can restore them with it so we're to help our neighbours and our brothers and to not stand by and watch while they face difficulty. In Romans 15, 2, let every one of us please his neighbour for his good to edification. And currently, when we think of it in terms 
of us and maybe the people in Israel. We are holding on to and protecting Yahusha. We're upholding his name unto that truth. And not just uh, Israel, but, but the whole world. We're, we're holding on to that truth until our neighbors return to him and to the truth of Yah. So all those people that refuse to, to acknowledge Yahusha, we are holding on to that truth. We're holding on to this truth and, and keeping it for for the people, for our neighbors and they return. And also the Torah, those people that do believe in Yahusha do not believe in Torah, we're holding on to and we're keeping hold of that Torah until they return as well. And hopefully these people, because uh, they're all our brethren, and hopefully they do return to the truth. And that's what we want. We don't want to see one sinner uh, perish. We want to see all uh, repent and come to the truth and be saved. Sherry says, his death brought blessings to all who embrace the gift of life. It reminds me of the parable of the seed that unless the seed dies, it cannot produce a beautiful plant that reproduces. Amen, Sherry. Thank you very much. So how do we show, so how do we show love to our neighbor, the last? Amen. I love that as well. It's, it's when we're talking about um, love Yahweh and, we, and, and love our neighbors, when we look at the commandments, we see the first one to four or the first one to five, because we could always put five in both and um, show us how to love Yah. And then five to ten, show us how to love our neighbor. And um, amen, you know, thank you for bringing that up. Verse five. So this kind of go, goes in with what someone brought up before about children as well. So the woman shall not wear that which pertains to a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do are so abomination unto Yahweh. So we see it forbids the practices of men dressing like women and women like men. It's viewed as an abomination to Yahweh and the other nations were driven out because of the abominations. We read this in, in Deuteronomy 18.12. For all that do these things are an abomination to Yahweh because they, because of these abominations, Yahweh drives them out from before you. And we see this in today's world. We see how, as mentioned, people are trying to change kids, you know, tell them that they can, if they're little boys, they can be little girls, or if they're little girls, they can be little boys. And it really is heartbreaking that there are there are laws now in place where if you're a parent and you want to stop that, you want them, you know, because kids will say silly stuff. <laughs> they will at silly ages, they will. My two-year-old before today has been going around. She's been tending to be all sorts of animals. I'm not going to go and tell her that she, yeah, you're a donkey now or you're a lion now and let them live like that. Go and get them some, you know, whatever a lion eats or whatever a donkey wants to eat and let her be like that. No, it's, you know, children are children and they say some some silly things. And and But the world today is so wicked, it wants to really make them become corrupt. They want to see them live unrighteous and, and become unclean and defile themselves. This is an abomination. And we shouldn't have men dressed as women. We shouldn't have women dressing as men. So we are, we should honor how Yahweh made us. It's one of the important thing. We do not want to change into something else. We were all made for his glory. Yahweh made us all unique and special and for his glory. Isaiah 43, 7. Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. And, and Yah has made us all unique and special, his peculiar treasure, and we should not be looking to change any of that. You know, we were talking about starting young with discipline so that your children know from an early age right and wrong. Well, that's gone out the window. But what is now being pushed at an early age? It's this gender confusion and it's being encouraged even by parents, uh, mm. teachers. It's just really sad that things have flipped completely in our society. No, it certainly isn't. Um, I'm sure many of you heard about the, the documentary that came out uh, within the past few months by Matt Walsh, uh, What is a Woman? And uh, me and Catherine uh, watched that and it really is, it's, it's so absurd, the things that they want to do. And the basis for all this, where it came from, it's, it's just... It's so disgusting. Absolutely, Asia. You took the words right out of my mouth. It's so disgusting. It's horrific as well. This, yeah, great words. It really is. And yeah, it is a sad world. And um, we just praise you every day for giving us the truth. I know I pray every night with my children. I just thank you every night for just 
helping us see truth and, and not just myself, my wife, but helping our children see truth as well. And just having that truth in them. And it's just like I say, something like Isaiah says, you know, it says in Isaiah, we're, we're all formed for his glory. You are creators all. And like I say, they just want to start from earlier, early age, corrupting our children. It is, it's so disgusting. Jen, it's also encouraged to act like animals in the classroom. If you want to be a cat, they can let them unbelievable. It certainly is. It's and when they get older, people can act how they want in, in these abominable abominable ways. And it's 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 horrific. It's the world is is falling so far away and it's it's getting really, really bad. Um, yeah, I think I've even seen where teachers have been fired because they wouldn't accept that narrative that these children are want they identify as a, a kitten or you know something that's just not realistic it, it's shocking isn't it it's that discipline's gone isn't it we're not allowed to discipline we're not allowed to have that authority and and put people to put children in line and just get them you know and it's not even it's like I say it's not even uh, like physically um trying to get them in line it's just telling them no you you're a little boy or you're a little girl and and you're not an animal and uh, I'm not going to, or I'm not going to call you that pronoun you want to be called. I'm going to call you by your name. It says on the register, on your birth certificate, that's what I'm going to call you. And they can get fired for that. They are grooming them all. And uh, it starts at an early age. It starts at an early age. They want to take our children from an earlier age to corrupt them, to groom them into whatever they want. Not what parents, parents don't have to say now. It's what these people in power believe. So. Verse six and seven. If a bird's nest chanced by the, if a bird's nest chanced to be before you in the way, in any tree or on the ground, whether they be young ones or eggs, and the dam sitting upon the young, or upon the eggs, you shall not take the dam with the young, but you shall in any wise let the dam go and take the young to you, that it may be well with you and that you may prolong your days. So we should not take. So here we're seeing a bit of this honor and compassion towards animals as well. And we should not take young and the mother, just the young or the eggs. We see to leave the mother. Again, we're seeing some honor being shown now. And it's also a sensible act to, to not take the mother as it will allow us to have more eggs. It'll, it'll, they'll produce more in the future. Through this act, we will prolong our days. Sorry, I just I missed that comment there. So, Machael, Isaiah 2.12, For Yahuwah of hosts has a day against all that is proud and lofty, against all that is lifted up, so that is brought low. Amen, brother. And that day is coming. I would say I'm not sure how close it is, but it is coming. And these people will have to answer for these um, this wickedness. So, verse 8, When you build a new house, then you shall make a battlement for the roof, that you bring not blood upon your house if any man fall from them. So this this law is in protection of yourself and others, and it's having an honor for life. Roofs used to be flat without any raised sides, and a battlement is um, would be a raised side around a roof, um, so no one would fall off. We have many examples in Scripture of people walking on their roofs. Uh, we see in 2 Samuel 11, 2, and it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon his roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. Acts 10, 9, on the morrow, as they went on to their journey and drew nigh into the city, Kepha went upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. So here we see a battlement was a defensive structure that would go around the edge and would be about chest high. When I was researching, I said about chest height, then head height in intervals would stop people from falling, but also allow for protection in battle and arrows to be fired from. So that's more to like you see when you look at like um, these pictures of castles and you see it's like up and down and up and down. That's what I've, when I've researched, says the battlement is and what Catherine's just said there, their boundaries to keep us safe. Um, we see that and. And it's having honor to the people that are in your house as well, the people that are under your roof, or, or in this case, on your roof. Um, you were to be protective of those people. And this was a way to protect them. So now we're going to go into some 
uh, a few verses about mixing. So verse 9, you shall not sow your vineyard with diverse seeds, lest the fruit of your seed, which you have sown, and the fruit of your vineyard be defiled. So this is something which is very relevant for today. We're to honor the plant life and Yahweh's creation and stop any possible hybridization and the creation of new forms of life. So today, companies are splicing animal DNA with seeds and creating these GMOs, these genetically modified crops. Yah sees this mixing as a defilement. I believe that when we look now at all these commands, these commands about not mixing certain things, they are symbolic. They are for a literal sense. We shouldn't be having these mixed seeds, and there's a reason for it. But also, it can be symbolic of mixing doctrines with truth, and that's a problem that we have. We see our truth, uh, Yah's word, being mixed constantly with other doctrines. We see it with um, Constantine and. I think it's 324 or whenever that was, um, during the reign of Constantine, where he, he mixed their beliefs with the beliefs of um, of Yaku Shah, you know, making these false idols, making these pagan days. We see it with, I spoke about last night in the video, the rerun last night about uh, Easter replacing Passover. We see it with December 25th with Nimrod and them trying to say that was Yaku Shah's, when Yaku Shah was born. So we, we come across all these things. But also, I, I think I heard a story as well, how there was tribes in Africa that were so independent and they could they didn't need to go anywhere. They could just, you know, they were living off their own works. And then these companies came in and gave them these seeds and these seeds only lived for a year. So after the year, you know, they gave them some for free. And then after the year, they had to go and pay for them. They had to go and get them. And it's, it's just another way of control and it's, you know, it, it's corrupting, it's defiling that natural creation of Yah. We're just trying to do it with all our food, with every aspect of our life. Verse 10, you shall not plow with an ox and an ass together. So different species cannot associate comfortably with another. And they have different strengths and heights and abilities. So, um, so obviously with the plowing, you can't have an ox up there plowing with a with an ass down there, a donkey down there. It wouldn't work. Uh, so we see this. And and for ourselves, we must be equally yoked with our spouses, with our partners, with our brethren. We shouldn't be unequally yoked. We must not be mixing, going against the natural order of Yahweh's creation. And I thought this was quite a good verse in Matthew 9, 16 and 17. No man puts a new puts a piece of new cloth onto an old garment. For that which is put in to fill it up takes from the garment and the rent is made worse. Neither do men put new wine into old wine skins, else the wine skins break and the new wine runs out and the wine skin perish. But they that put new wine into new wine skins and both are preserved. Absolutely, Nina. Yeah, now they're most likely mixing DNA, nothing new under the sun. They certainly are. We have all this CRISPR-9 technology and all this technology where it's all about um, corrupting DNA, mixing DNA. And there's a certain thing about at the moment, it's been around for a few years, where they're trying to do that in other ways, I believe, as well. I know everybody has different opinions on stuff, but they are in any way possible just trying to corrupt the DNA, our DNA, yours creation into something which is abomination, really. Yeah, I think that verse you already shared earlier goes perfect with this verse 10 as well. You know, out of 2 Corinthians 6, 14, I'll read it again. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion has light with darkness. It is definitely important who we yoke ourselves with. You know, the yoke balances the burden and makes it easier to manage. And a metaphor in the scriptures for this could be bondage or servitude. No, absolutely. Like I say, we need to really be careful who we are yoking ourselves with. Um, that's so true. We need to be really careful and making sure we are equally yoked. Like you say, we, we work together, don't we? And, and if, if one is unequally yoked, that means that there's more pressure, there's more work, there's more on one person than the other. And um, it's not good. No, thank you for bringing that up again. It's such a relevant scripture that 
Uh, verse 11, you shall not wear a garment of diverse sorts as a woolen and linen together. So I'm sure there's more people that know about uh, woolen and linen. A little research I did uh, is I found that wool has natural UV protection. Has Oh, Sabathlan, thank you very much for joining us. Shabbat Shalom, brothers. Great to have you here. Um, wool has natural UV protection, has antibacterial and antimicrobial properties which prevent mold and mildew from growing it regulates body temperature before it keeps so therefore it keeps the body warm or cool depending on the season it insulates even when wet and is very durable linen fibers uh, have high breathability antibacterial and hypopolygenic properties linen is anti-static which explains why it doesn't cling to the body and generally stays clean longer as this naturally repels dirt. Also a temperature regulating natural insulator. And I know there's many people that talk about, uh, that know a lot more about these and also, uh, I believe there's frequencies as well to do with this, which Lee just brought up. Yep, they cancel each other out. I've heard that as well. Thank you, Lee. That they both have different frequencies and when they put them on, they both cancel each other out and therefore you don't get the use of them. Uh, uh, they don't get the benefits of these frequencies and you won't get the benefits of any of these properties either through this mixing. So yeah, I do green. have a note on some numbers here uh, regarding frequencies. And we see that the body has a frequency of 100. And so does organic cotton is right at 100. But your man-made materials like polyester, nylon, and rayon, they have a frequency of 15 which is actually the same frequency as a dead human body. Oh, wow. Linen and wool, though, would be considered like a super frequency. Uh, they both have a frequency of 5,000. But interesting enough, when you wear them together, they cancel each other out to zero, just like they were saying. No, that's some great numbers. Wow. That's, that's very interesting, that how uh, the, the, the clothes that we're given today, the like have that frequency of a dead body it's very interesting that um and and that's and, why you see it kind of cling to each other you know out of the dryer it's because they are absorbing that frequency and energy from the other clothes oh wow like i say i'm not um i'm not studied on the frequencies but i know there's so much in it it's so important um no oh, no thank you for bringing that i know there's a lot of people that have done a lot of research on them as well that's great uh Door of Yahweh said as well, together wool and linen create a combustion reaction. Oh, scary. <laughs> it's a bit <laughs> scary. Though. Um, so believe that both have healing properties. Uh, and what's interesting is that, that science didn't know this until recently, which I always I always love when we, we have something that's in scripture and at the time, you know, people, you know, well, in recent times people didn't understand it and then science comes out and, and gives us reasons for that they won't give any credit to yar and his word though they'll believe that it's from their own you know their own genius they found it but we see here how uh, how yar gives us these commands and they're all for our good it's it's like what uh, you and lee spoke out several weeks ago about the clean and unclean foods men didn't know about this at the time but yar did and yar gives us those commands or even the gemstones that are used in oh, New Year's line. Absolutely wonderful that. Um, that's absolutely wonderful. Those, you know, yeah, there's no way to know that um, when when Revelation was wrote at all. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we were only finding this out. When's that video from David Paulson? I don't know, is it 10, 20 years old or something? It's, 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 it's not that old. Um, and it's only recent technology where they're, they're being able to see that. So it is wonderful. Uh, Sabah Flam says, in the diverse seeds, sometimes I wonder if this is about not using native and introducing non-native invasion species to an unnatural habitat. No, that's very interesting as well because everything has its own place on yours creation, in yours world for it to grow. So when you're bringing something over from one country to another, is that is that defining the land in a sense because it wasn't created for that area that's very interesting i've never thought about it that way so thank you very much it's such an interesting point now i say y'all create everything for a reason and it's 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 not for us to understand 
um, and things that we do not understand. So these are all commandments that pertain to not mixing, which should not be mixed. We shouldn't be mixing these things. Could be symbolic of our beliefs. We should not mix our beliefs in Yahusha and Yahweh with other doctrines, doctrines of man, as it will not benefit it will not be beneficial and will cause sin. As we spoke about these pagan days, um, these pagan forms of worship, you know, these places where people go and worship now on the wrong day and would appear to, to sound like high places and you know these 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 churches which appear look like they've got obelisks on and um, all these things which we're told to not be doing we see it mixed with Yah's word and Yahushua told us that we cannot serve two at once we must honor and serve Yah obeying his law and not taken away from the, his word Shabbat Shalom Euphrasia thank you for joining us and uh, Matthew 6 24 says no man can serve two Adonai for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve two Elohim and Mammon. So we cannot be mixing a uh, Yah's word with other pagan ways or even the world. We, we just make sure that we are staying undefiled in Yah's word. And again, just on this, I just found it interesting. I just spent a bit of time looking at this because I found it quite interesting. Um, the three examples that we are to not mix we have the seed so this could be a symbolic of what we put on our in us you know physically and spiritually you get amen sherry yard does not like the lukewarm the ox could be symbolic of that work the actions of our hands and garments could be symbolic of what we wear what we cover ourselves and in that blood of yahusha i just found these quite interesting these three choices um Therefore, we must ensure that we are pure and undefiled by religions and the world in all aspects of our life and worship. Psalm 191, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the Torah of Yahuwah. So I just found it quite interesting, these three examples that we're given. So verse tw uh, 12, 22-12 now. You shall make fringes upon the four quarters of your vesture, wherewith you cover yourself so this command is only found here and in numbers this command for seats. we see it in numbers 15 38 and 39 it says speak unto the children of yasharel and bid them that they make the zizi in the borders of their garments throughout their generations and they that put upon the zizi of their borders a ribbon of blue and it shall be unto you a zizi and you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of yahweh and do them that you may seek not after your own hearts and your own eyes after the which you used to go whoring and this is something that my wife Catherine spoke about on last week's show um, and i believe that this tuesday um in walking the word she is going to be doing um a lesson on how to make cc so if you can check that out and again i find it interesting that in numbers when we see this command it is just after the people had rebelled against your and um, had had the evil report and how they had uh, gone into battle without Yah. I just find it quite interesting that this follows it. You know, it's, it's a reminder of the commandments and, and to do them and to really stay true to Yah. Well, I find it interesting also. You see it says right there throughout their generations, just yeah. like it says with the Shabbat and, the, you know, following the Torah. No, it is very interesting, isn't it? It's very interesting, and um, it would appear that it is for for all throughout our generations. It's a sign, isn't it? It's it's that sign to remember. Um, it does appear that way. Pureshaman dot com has them. That's our Nietzsche Moshe. Um, is that Aziz each we're talking about? I think now? it's the linen products. Oh, linen products. Oh, yeah. I see a comment now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know Nietzsche. She spoke. She knows a lot about the um, the, the the frequencies and and um, clothing and that. So yeah, so yeah, check out that website if you can. Pure PureShaman.com. Yeah, make sure you check that out. So they were to be worn as a sign of faith in remembrance of the commandments. In Matthew nine twenty, we read, "And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood twelve years came behind him and touched his zizi of his garment." And she said within herself, if I may touch his garment, I shall be whole. But Yahushua turned 
him about and when he saw her he said daughter be of good comfort your faith has made you whole and the woman was made whole from that hour so this touching of yahushua zitis was an act of the woman's faith you know that through touching yahushua she would be healed and um, just think it's quite interesting i know Catherine did a more in-depth study on these zitis last week we should also um we also see how people took more pride in them than obeying yahweh's word we know that yahushua rebukes them in uh, we read matthew 23 5 but all their works they do to be seen of men, they make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the zitzit of their garments. Um, so we see there, it's they're not to be a show for other people. It's if you've got them and you're wearing them, it's a great conversation star. It's a great, um, it's great to see other people in the faith that walk it by seeing the zitzit. However, they are there for a reminder for ourselves. So, um, and, we, and it's just wonderful this how this woman touched Yahushua's zitzit and was healed. It really is just um, just beautiful. Yeah, I've got a cool story. A friend of ours uh, told us once how she actually got into the fellowship that she's a part of now. She was just at a grocery store. I think she had an appointment and some things got messed up. So that got canceled. And so she just stopped by the grocery to do some things. And she was in the checkout line. And the guy behind her asked, hey, I I love your seat seats. Are you a part (laughs) of a fellowship? And, you know, that's what she had been praying for was to find a local group. And so it was by that alone, you know, that that conversation started and that relationship began. No, that's amazing, isn't it? Especially if she's been praying for it and y'all answered her prayers. No, no, that's wonderful. It it really, y'all work so so well in our lives. We don't even realize it sometimes how his hand is upon our lives. And that's just, uh, amen. Amen. I love that as well, because some people like to try and say that it's just for men as well, these eat seats, but it's 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 for all the children, I believe, men and women. Uh, verse uh, 13 through now to 19. So if a man take a woman and go into her and hate her and give occasions of speech against her and bring up an evil name upon her and say, I took this woman and when I came into her, I found her not a maid, then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity unto the elders of the city in the gate. And the damsel's father shall say unto the elders, I gave my daughter unto the man to be his woman, and he hates her. And lo, he has given occasions of speech against her, saying, I found not your daughter a maid. And yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity, and they shall be spread. They shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city, and the elders that Elders of the city shall take the man and chastise him, and they shall admerse him in a hundred shekels of silver and give them unto the father of the damsel, because he has brought up an evil name upon a virgin of Yasharel, and she shall be a woman, she shall be his woman, he may not put her away all of his days. No, that really wasn't sorry. Um sorry about Ali. Yeah, James, that was a wonderful story. Uh, oh, love the story of the woman with the issue of blood, yeah. Her faith was amazing. Yahushua loves beyond our understanding. Amen, Lee. Absolutely. So I was just reading there, so I couldn't say that. So here we see that if a man was to have a bad word against his wife and smeared her and was proven to be lying. Now, these um, these tokens, these were to be the bed sheets, um, you know, covered in blood. Don't want to go into much detail, but I'm sure you understand, you know, and um, if she was a virgin, then after, you know, they consummate the marriage, bed sheets would have blood on it, and the and the parents were to have these to be uh, to be a token, to be um, to be a witness of of um, of a virginity. So if her husband then brought this lie against her, we'll see then that um, tried to smear her and was proven to be a lie, and he would be punished by the elders. We find a hundred shekels of silver, and that which would be given to the father. And, and he must uh, care and marry this woman because it was very, you know, back then as well, it's, it's, we're, we're very more freer here and looser here, which isn't a good thing at all. Um, and, you know, people would want to marry and, and be pure in their marriage and their relationship. So if this person was going around and, and smearing and tarnishing the reputation of this woman, no one else would want to marry her. And um, 
and we see how Yah there is, is showing that honor and respect for the woman in protecting her, and we must honor our wives, you know, not bringing these evil reports against them. So verse 20 onwards. But if it be true and tokens of virginity be not found for the damsel, then they shall bring out the damsel to the door of her father's house, and the men of the city shall stone her with stones, that she die, because she was wrought folly in Yasharel to play the whore in the father's house. So shall she put so shall you put away evil from among you. So if what the man had said was to be true, and the woman was found to have been lied and lying and was not a virgin, then she would be taken out in stones. And this is because she had defiled her father's house, as we spoke about. It was very, it was all about honor, you know, and, and this reputation which would have been um, corrupted through this act. We see this spoken of with uh, Yahushua's mother in, in Miriam, Mary, you know, how um, she feared that she may be viewed as this. Uh, by becoming pregnant but it was through the ruach oh amen john yeah um example of the blood covenant thank you very much for that it's a great comment so we see in matthew 1 18 onwards it says now the birth of yahushua mashiach was on the why on this wise when as his mother miriam was espoused to yosef before they came together she was found with child of the ruach HaKodesh. and yosef her man being a just man and not willing to make her a public example was minded to put her away privily but while he thought on these things behold the angel of yah appeared unto him in a dream saying yosef the son of david fear not to take unto you miriam your woman for she has conceived in her uh, for what is conceived in her is of the ruach hakodesh so yosef was assured that the conception was from yahweh and not another man and that she wasn't defiled um before their marriage but we see how how Yosef didn't want to didn't want it to be uh, tarnished or smeared prior to the angel telling him either. And we see that Yashar will be punished for their disobedience and following other Elohim, their whoring and their adultery. We see many examples of this. Uh, just two here I've got in Judges. Um, yeah, Amen, John. Thank you very much for that, brother. Me saying amen as well. So Judges 2, 13 to 15, and they forsook Yahweh and served Baal and Asherah, and the anger of Yahweh was hot against Yasharal, and he delivered them into the hands of the spoilers that spoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about, so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. Whatsoever they went out, that whatsoever they went out, the hand of Yahweh was against them for evil, as Yahweh had said, and as Yahweh had sworn seven oaths unto them. And they were greatly distressed. We see here how they they served these other Elohim, these false idols, Baal and Asherah, and we see this um, this whoring and idolatry. Hosea chapter nine says, "Rejoice not, O Yasharel, for joy, as other people, for you have gone a whoring from your Elohim. You have loved a reward upon every threshing floor. The floor of the winepress shall not feed them, and the new wine shall fail in her." They shall not dwell in Yahweh's hand, but Ephraim shall return to Mitzrayim, and they shall eat unclean things in Asherah. So we see that Yah was angered for the lies and the whoredoms to other Elohims. And, and we see that here we are supposed to be that pure bride for Yahusha. We are, we are supposed to be waiting. We're not supposed to be defiling ourselves with these other false religions. So verse 22 and 20 uh, to 24 if a man be found lying with a woman married to a man then they shall both of them die both the man that lay with the woman and the woman so shall he put away from the evil if a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed, betrothed unto a man and a man find her in the city and lie with her then you shall bring them both out of the gate of the city they shall stone them with stones and they die the damsel because she cried not being in the city, and the man, because he was humble, he has humbled his neighbor's wife, so you shall put away evil from among you. So, in the case of breaking wedlock, if consensual, the pair would be punished by death. And we know that this is in the Ten Devarim, the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, 14, you shall not break wedlock. So we see, and again, we see this is um, this having this spiritual aspect as well, so we should not be breaking wedlock with your 
her on verse 25 to 27. But if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field, and the man force her and lie with her, then the man only that lay with her shall die. But unto the damsel you shall do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death. For as when a man rises against his neighbor and slays him, even so is this matter. For he found her in the field, and the betrothed damsel cried, and there was none to save her. So we see this one different here. This is by taking her by force. And then the man was to be killed. And we see this compassion to be had on the woman as she did not consent. So we see the difference there to the previous case here. We see the woman cried out and no one was there to help save her. Therefore, she would not be guilty of any sin that happened to her. If a man find a damsel that is a virgin, and which is not betrothed, and lay hold of her, and lie with her, and they, and they be found, and the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver, and shall, and she shall be his woman, because he has humbled her, he may uh, not put her away all these days. So this is then, so the man should pay the father and take the woman to be his wife. So here we see if they were to, to, to be together out of wedlock, um, and this is not by force now, then he shall keep her and not put her away because she, she would be considered defiled in the community, as we spoke about before, this honour. Um, but her reputation would have been smeared. She would have been considered defiled and no one would have wanted to marry her. Therefore, um, this man, uh, which is right, he, he, he slept with her, so we should marry her. They should be together. Um, and dowries were common when taken up. These dowries were common when taken away. We read it, Deuteronomy 22, 30. Oh, that's the next verse, yeah. So we see that this this money, this dowry was common when taken away. Um, so verse 30, um, man shall not take his father's woman nor discover his father's skirt. So as mentioned before, when we were talking about that first form, first, um, first uh, lesson, Sorry, I can't get words out with Reuben um, and how he lost it. You know, we are not to take our father's wife, or we will be cursed, or we'll lose our blessing if we do so. It was common between other nations, especially royalty, but we are not to follow their ways. And um, yeah, it was very common for for many. Um, you know, when a father died, they had a son for that son to take the. The, his mother as his wife we see this um in egypt and other places you know and uh you asked him you're not to do this uh first corinthians 5 1 it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as it is not so not so much as named among the other nations that one should have his father's woman so we see that as well spoken by four and uh in by paul in first corinthians as well how these acts would be happening so chapter 23. So he that is wounded in the stones or has his privy member cut off shall not enter into the assembly of Yahuwah. So here we're going to be looking at how we are to honor Yahuwah in his assembly and we're not to enter in if we are defiled. So here we're, we're talking about a man's manhood, <laughs> shall we say. Uh, so if a man was or is to have any of these, um, these issues that's mentioned here, then they were to be considered as being defiled. Now, in many other cultures, these practices were performed to create what's called enux. Enux, I think I said that right, which would be have and they would have specific social functions. So, when I was looking at this, it, it sounds like some of them they would do it um, from to be guards of women, soldiers, servants, and in some places as well, they were done so they would be better singers. <laughs> It really is, a, yeah, it's a barbaric, disgusting um, act. And as we have mentioned before that today, we're seeing these operations performed on children as well, these um, these type of operations, and it really is disgusting. We're told that, you know, we shouldn't be wearing, um, mentioned be wearing women's clothes, but here we're told as well that they shouldn't be having anything done to, to, that, to their manhood, shall we say, um, or they would be considered defiled. Well, and not only maybe physically, but also I know chemically it's being done as well. I'm sure yeah. that falls right in line. No, definitely as well. I believe so. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, I, I believe so as well. Yeah, it falls in this, and you know, we should we shouldn't be doing anything to to our bodies. You know, they are the creation; they were created by Yah. Uh, we should be honoring Him through honoring ourselves as well, honoring our bodies. So it's very interesting, especially with, like say all the things that are going on in this world today. So a verse two: A bastard shall not enter into the assembly of Yahweh, even to his tenth generation shall not enter into the assembly of Yahweh. Yeah agree michael abominations absolutely abominations so when we look at the word for bastard it is page four four six four mamzar and when we see the definition pardon me it says bastard child of incest illegitimate child it says also mixed population born of a jewish father and heathen mother or vice versa i believe we certainly are Asia. we certainly are all beautifully made i believe that this is in relation more to being born out of wedlock or incest rather than uh, being you know of mixed nations you know um uh, having a you know father or mother from different uh, religions different nations i believe it's more to do with incest and um, being born out of wedlock but if not i believe that when one renounces, as we looked at before, one with the shaving of the head and renouncing the past, I believe that one renounces their past, turns to Yah and their whole heart, with their whole heart, and they become a member of Yasharel. You know, they become grafted in. They are no longer considered a, a bastard in a sense here. Like I said, I do believe it's more of a incestual or out of wedlock sense rather than a, you know, one parent from Yasharel and the other not. Um, so all those that do believe are grafted in, as I just spoke of there, we see John 1, 12 and 13, but as many as received him, to them gave him power to become the sons of Elohim, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of Elohim. So we see that when we believe in Yahushua, when we believe on the name of Yah, we are sons of Elohim, we are sons of Yah, um, we are grafted in. I believe today is more of a spiritual sense as Yah sent the tribes to the nations, as we spoke about before. Therefore, if we are not followers of Yahusha, we are not children of Yahuwah, he is not our father, and we're not bastards, as we spoke of before. Yah is our heavenly father. We need to be a, we need to be really in sub, supplication to him and, and trusting in him and believing on him. Hebrews 12, 7 and 8 says, If you endure chastising, Elohim deals with you as his sons. What Ele what son is he whom the father chastises not? But if ye be without chastisement, wherefore are all partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. And as you spoke about before from Proverbs, the father chastises son for love, for correction, and, and Yah does it to us. If we, and if we, so, you know, if you're going through trials, tribulations, chastisement, you know, if you're going through difficult times, just believe it that the reason you're going through that is because you are a son of Yahweh, you are a son of Elohim, you are his children, and that should just really just bring you comfort in those times when you really are going through difficult times. Do not believe it is because Yahweh has turned away from you, Yahweh has denounced you, it's because Yahweh loves you, and we all want to correct and chastise and, and really, you know, help our children walk in those righteous ways, and that's what Yah is doing to us. Yeah, hallelujah indeed, hallelujah. Because I know there's there's so many of us that are going through difficult times and it can help you turn away. It can help you lose focus and lose track of the truth and, and Yard's love. But he's doing it because he loves you. So verse 3 to 6. An Amorite or a Moabite shall not enter into the assembly of Yahweh, even to their tenth generation. Shall they not enter into the assembly of Yahweh forever? Because they met you with not with met you not with bread. And with water in the way when you came for about Mitzrayim, and because they hired against you, Balam and the son of Beor, of Pethor, of Aram Naharemi, to curse you. Nevertheless, Yahweh Haker would not hearken unto Balam, but Yahweh Haker turned the curse into a blessing unto you, because Yahweh Haker loved you. You shall not seek their peace nor their prosperity all your days forever. So these people did not honor Yah or Yasharel when they're in the wilderness. Therefore, we should 
not be honoring them, he's saying then. But however, they should not be honored the same. And we see that this does raise a question about uh, King David through these verses. Daniel says, And Yahushua answered, said unto them, They that are holy, not physician, but they that are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Amen, brother. Certainly did. Amen. So we know with, with King David, following he comes from uh, uh, the line of Ruth. So following the death of Ruth's husband, we read that Ruth wants to cleave to Naomi and to follow her Elohim. In Ruth 1.16, it says, And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to return from following after you, for whither you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your Elohim, my Elohim. So I believe that through her original marriage and this decision, she was grafted in. However, she was of uh, the other nations. She really was grafted in through having this want, this heart to really want to cleave to Naomi and cleave to her Elohim, to Yahweh. And we, we, were, we also read how she was acquired by Boaz in, in the chapter 4, verse 10. Says more of a roof, the Moavim, the woman of Machlan, have I purchased to be my woman? So we see that how Boaz purchased her and, and really she was grafted in. In this act, we have a beautiful picture of how we have been purchased through the blood of Yahusha. Acts 20 28 says, Take heed thereof unto yourselves and to all your flock over the which the Ruach HaKodesh has made you overseers to feed the called out assembly of Elohim which he has purchased with his own blood. So we can just see that in this picture of Boaz buying Ruth, we see the picture of Yahusha buying us, you know, grafting us in through that blood, through that sacrifice. And I believe that no matter what nation anybody's from, no matter what past anybody's from, as long as they turn to Yah with that full heart, that circumcised heart of wanting to really cleave to his word, to cleave to him, to follow him, to shamar his word, they will be grafted and they will be considered sons of Elohim. If that, that is what the key is. We need to really be having that, that circumcised heart and wanting to keep his word. And when we, and David truly was, you know, he really was circumcised in the heart for Yah as well. He really did seek Yah. Same with Naomi. Well, and you can and see Ruth. through that beautiful story of Ruth, you know, being the great grandmother of David and then, on down the line, Messiah, all through that same bloodline. No, yeah, it is is wonderful, isn't it? It really is wonderful. Like I say, she just she she wanted to to really cleave. She didn't want to go back to her nation. She wanted to go with Naomi to to her nation and to serve her Elohim. And they say she was then grafted in and, and considered a child a child of Yah. So verse 7 and 8, you shall not ad adhor an Adami, for he is your brother. You shall not adore a Mitzrayi, because you are a stranger in this land. The children that are begotten of them shall enter into the assembly of Yahweh in the third generation. So Yahweh instructs us to honor the Adani, uh, who is the brother of Esau. Uh, he was our brother, Esau. Uh, and we are to honor the Mitzrayi, or Egyptians, as we were strangers in the land. You know, we are brought us out there, but we were strangers in the land. Spiritually, we can see how we are to honor our brothers in Yahusha, but we should not. We should also be honoring the stranger, those that are not followers in the way. So we really should be honoring all people. We should be making sure that we are, as as um, Robert says every week. You know, putting a smile on. And, you know, just being nice to everybody, not just believers in Yah, but really. To everybody we come across, we know we are to be that. Um, we are a representation. We are a representative of Yah in our dealings with people around us, and we really need to make sure that we are always having that honor, that love, and compassion to people. First Peter two seventeen says, "Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear Elohim, honor the king." So it doesn't mean we need to have, have to agree with people. It doesn't mean we need to, you know do things that people say if they contradict Yah's word and, and they're wicked. But we should be having that honor and compassion for people. Uh, verse 9 to 11. 
When the host goes forth against your enemies, the guard, then guard you from every wicked thing. If there be among you any man that is not clean by reason of uncleanness, that uh, uncleanness that chanted him by night, then shall he go abroad out of the camp. He shall not come in to come in within the camp, but he shall be when evening comes down. He shall wash himself with water. When the sun goes down, he shall come into the camp again. So this uncleanness is through accident in this example here we see how the people the person was to remove themselves and stay outside of the camp in an area that would have been constructed or separate from the camp so they would have had an area where they could go in where they were clean they were not part of the camp but they were not just left in nowhere and um, and at the beginning of the next day when the sun goes down they were to be clean after washing and it reminds me of that remission of the immersion for the remission of sins, you know, our baptism, we see in Acts 2, 3, 8. It says, then Kepha said unto them, repent and be baptized, everyone, in the name of Yahushua, Hamashiach, for the remission of sins, that you receive the gift of the Ruach HaKadosh. And this, this water, you know, makes me think of Yahushua and how we're washed clean of our sins and our and uncleanness. And again, we see how it's an example of how that... Um, uncleanness would spread among the camp so we need to make sure they're, they're out of the camp to not defile the people around them uh, verse 12 to 14 you shall have a place also without the camp whether you shall go forth abroad and you shall have a paddle upon your weapon and it shall be when you will ease yourself abroad you shall dig therewith and shall turn back and cover that which comes from you for Yahweh walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you and to give up your enemies before you. Therefore shall your camp be holy and shall see no unclean thing in you and turn away from you. So they were not to make the camp unclean for their toilet habits and they were to do it outside of the camp. And we see here how they would have a shovel on their weapon and be able to clean up after themselves. And we must treat our homes and our bodies like this. Yahweh dwells with us, therefore we must ensure that we are clean. We are making sure that we are cleaning ourselves from any unrighteousness, any wickedness, that we are really just making our camp clean. Remember, our bodies are the temple of Yahweh. Plainness and set apartness go together. Amen. Amen, brother. They certainly do. We see this, that y'all would not be among the camp if it wasn't clean therefore then we must be thinking about ourselves well if we're not clean if our bodies aren't clean then will y'all be dwelling with us and in our homes so we need to really make sure that we do remove any uncleanness second corinthians 16 to 18 and what agreement has the temple of elohim with idols you are the temple of the living elohim as elohim has said I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, says Yahweh, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says Yahweh, sever oat. And 1 Corinthians three sixteen and 17. Know ye not that ye are the temple of Elohim, and that the Ruach Elohim dwells in you? If any man defile the temple of Elohim, him shall Elohim destroy, for the temple Elohim is holy, which temple you are. So we can see those verses there really just support what I was saying about how we are that temple, and we should be making sure that we are clean and set apart, uh, like like Machael said, clean cleanness and set apartness go together, and we should be making sure that we are clean and set apart. So uh, Deuteronomy 15 and 16. You shall not deliver unto his Adonai the servant which escaped from his Adonai unto you. He shall dwell with you among, even among you, in that place which you shall choose in one of your gates where it likes him best. You shall not oppress him. Shabbat Shalom, James. Oh, thank you very much, brother. It's, it's great to have you with us. It really is. Um, so many people with us. Thank you so much. And thank you for all your comments as well. I uh, really do, really do enjoy them. So we are to treat our servants like family. Therefore, if a servant has escaped from someone, from their master, it's because they've been treated poorly or uh, been oppressed or they're living in poor conditions. You know, we're told in Deuteronomy 24, 14, which we'll get to in a bit, you shall not oppress a hired servant that is poor and needy, wherewith he be of your brethren or of your strangers that are 
in your land within your gates so the reason this person oh texas it's good to have you with his brother and um, this person this servant would have left because they were being afflicted they were being oppressed they were living in poor conditions however they were not been being treated in accordance with yah's word so when they they flee it's for good reason we should be offering that protection to them offering that place of refuge and not sending them back to where they've came um, just again showing that honor and that compassion to people you know we hear a lot of um you know slavery and servants and how they're treated but when we look at scripture yah has a very different way of how we should be treating servants of bond men and bond women they should be like children at the end of their seven years they should be wanting to stay and be part of the family that's how well they should be treated they should be treated like sons and daughters and it is um it's wonderful it really is and we see that difference there between slavery that's gone on throughout all the other nations and what you're actually intended for how people should be treated so verse 17 and 18 there shall be no whore of your daughters of Yasharel, nor a sodomy of the sons of Yasharel. You shall not bring the hire of a whore or the price of a dog into the house of Yahweh Haker for any vow. For even both these are abominations into Yahweh Haker. So we are not to make our bodies property and defile ourselves through these actions, through these practices of prostitution. There are many cultures and nations that view prostitution as a religious act. You know, many of the pagan religions, their, their gods and goddesses were to do with fertility um you know and and they would you know it'd all be about you know yeah uh, fornication and um, this practice we read later did infiltrate and corrupted the practice in yasharel and amos 2 7 it says that pant after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor and turn aside the way of the meek and a man and his father will go into the same maid to profane my holy name and it's believed that actually some of these places that were set up actually had these false worships and and would actually have prostitutes outside the temples and it really is um it's you know it's so far removed from what yar intended and um if you read amos it's all about the destruction that's about to, to befall them because of how far they have strayed from yar's word it's all about their unjustness their wickedness their corruptness and it's very i think relevant for the world we live in today so we see that how you know Yar is saying that you should not be doing these practices and you should definitely not be doing them um where where my name set and that's what they were doing uh, verse 19 20 you shall not lend upon ursary to your brother ursary of money ursary of victuals ursary of anything that is lent unto ursary and to a stranger you may lend upon ursary but unto your brethren you shall not lend upon ursary that Yahweh can may bless you in all that you set your hand in and that uh, to you set your hand to in the land wherever you go to possess it. So this ursary is putting uh, interest on a loan. You know, it's, we all have loans, I'm sure, or taken out loans of some form um, for something from a bank or somewhere in our lives and they put interest on it. And here we're told that that's an abomination to you doing that. Um. They should not be putting interest on a loan that is your brother. And this is because Yah does not wish for us to become indebted again. Debt leads to slavery, and he delivered us from the bonds of slavery in Mitzrayim. He doesn't want to see his people go back into that slavery. He doesn't want to see them go back and be indebted to other nations. We'll see next week. He, he wants his people to be the head and not the tail. And we'll go into that next week. But, um, yeah, we see here it's open up as well. We should honor our brothers and not be looking to benefit at their expense ezekiel 18 8 and 9 says he that have not given forth upon urgery neither has taken any increase that has withdrawn his hand from iniquity has executed true judgment between man and man has walked in my statute and has guarded my judgments to deal truly he is just he shall li surely live says adonai yahweh so we see here those that haven't put that urgery that haven't put that interest on or you know increase the burden or the 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 loan of the people we see out there they're walking in justice uh, in in yours in yours justice and his, his ways and yahushua told us that we should give without hoping to get more back 
and that our reward will be great if we do so. Luke 6, 34 onwards says, and if you lend to them of whom he hoped to receive, what thank have you? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your, ye your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great, and you shall be the children of El Elyon, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. So we should really be looking to lend and not be wanting to you know, put interest in and receiving more back when we do. We should just be doing it out of honour, compassion again, respect for people. Yeah. Um, and when you make, when you shall vow, vow unto Yahweh al you shall not slack to pay it, for Yahweh al will surely require it of you, and it would be sin in you. So when we make a promise, we must honour Yah and keep that promise, or it is considered a sin. We see this with Hannah and her righteousness in upholding her vow. Oh, thank you very much, Asia. It's so wonderful to have you with us. There's a lot in here today, so I thank you all for, for sticking around with us. There's there's so many commands in this. Um, so 1 Samuel 11, we read, And she vowed a vow and said, O oh, Yahweh Sebao, if you will indeed look on my the affliction of your handmaid and remember me and not forget your handmaid, but will give unto your handmaid a male child, then I will give him unto Yahweh all the days of his life. He shall no razor come upon his head. And then verse 27 and 28, For this child I prayed, and Yahweh has given me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to Yahweh. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to Yahweh, and he worship Yahweh. As we see there with uh, with Hannah and, and having Samuel um he, she, Yah listened to her and gave her a child in Samuel, and he, and she gave him to Yah. We see a keeper promise. It must have been very difficult for her to do that, but she gave that promise to Yah, and she was blessed with other children afterwards. Uh, Tobit four eleven for Elms is the good gift, and to all that give it in the sight of El Elyon. Amen. Yeah, amen. Such a great book, Tobit. Uh, such a great book, Catherine. Uh, brought me to that book and it really is such a wonderful read so and i know that this is something that you touched upon um when you were talking on your show on thursday weren't you you, you talked about how we shouldn't be making vows and not keeping them yeah i mean it really boils down to another way of taking the name in vain you know all promises and vows that we make are to yah um, and so we need to honor them to our fullest, make sure that we're not, you know, halfway completing them or neglecting them completely. I have a, I shared a verse in that show. I'll read it again. I thought it was, it just fits so well with all these, you know, you have the, the 10 commandments, but then all these others as well. Uh, this is out of James two, eight through 10. If ye fulfill the Royal mitzvah, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Ye do well. But if ye have respect of persons, ye commit sin and are convicted by the Torah as transgressors. For whosoever shall guard the whole Torah and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So it just shows the importance of all of these, you know, not just the ones that you want to pick or put at the top, but all of these are extremely important and like it says, most of these really do show how to love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. Amen. Thank you for that, brother. Such a great book, isn't it, James? It is. We just finished reading it. It's a, a quick read, but so, so much valuable content inside. Yeah, it really is. Um, so verse 23, uh, 22 and 23. But if you shall forbear to vow, it shall be no sin in you. That which is gone out of your lips, you shall guard and perform even a free will offering according as you have vowed unto Yahweh Haker, which you have promised within your mouth. So it's best sometimes to not make a vow if you're not fully committed to it. We, um, you know, if you're not really going to keep it. Um, Ecclesiastes 5 4 When you vow a vow unto Elohim, defer not to pay it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay that which you have vowed better is he that vowed that should not vow than he that should vow and not pay so we must be careful with what we say 
if we're prepared to actually keep those promises or not. So we must be really careful. And like I said, sometimes it's better to not make a vow if you're not prepared to keep it. When you come into your neighbor's vineyard, then you may eat grapes. Uh, you'll fill at your own pleasure, but you shall not put any in your vessel. When you come into, into the standing grain of your neighbor, then you may pluck the ears with your hand, but you shall not move a sickle into your neighbor's standing grain. So we are to honor our neighbors and not to fill our baskets of grapes or take a sickle of grain, but we're able to take a handful and thus to sustain life. Uh, you know, we're allowed to, if we're traveling through, if we're sojourning through, we are allowed to take a handful of grapes or grain to eat to help us. And we see this with Yahushua and his Talmudim when they journeyed through the fields. And we see it in Matthew 12, 1. At that time, Yahushua went on the Sabbath through the field and his Talmudim were hungry and began to pluck the heads of the grain and to eat. And in Mark 2, 23, and it came to pass that he went through the field on the Sabbath and his Talmudim began as they went to pluck the heads of the grain. So we see how you know, we're allowed to do that, but we need to have honor for the person whose field it is and not take more than what are we are required what we need to sustain ourselves really yeah I'm just getting sorry uh, yeah michael 12 psalm 12 6 the words of yahweh are clean words silver tried in a furnace of earth find seven times amen brother and as soon as we go on what james is saying these all these words we should be looking at so verse 24 now chapter 24 shall i say so when a man has taken a woman and married her and it comes to pass that she find no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a sephir of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. And when she's departed out of the house, she may go and be another man's woman. And if the latter man hate her and write her a sephir of divorcement and gives it in her hand and sends her out of the house, or if the latter man dies, which took her to be his woman, the former man which sent her away may not take her again to be his woman after that she is defiled for that is abomination before yahweh and you shall not cause the land to sin but which yahweh Hagar gives you to an inheritance so we see that once a woman was divorced and they remarried they were not to go back to a husband that divorced her we see that yahweh gave a bit of divorcement to yasharel uh, Jeremiah or Yirmiyahu 3 8 says, And I saw when you when for all the causes whereby backsliding Yashro broke wedlock, I have put her away and given her a separate of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Yahuda feared not, but went and played the harlot also. So only death would break this covenant and purify us to re enter into that covenant. Yah divorced his people. And this is a beautiful picture of why we Yahusha had to come and die for us. Second Corinthians eleven two says, For I am a jealous El, I am jealous over you of a righteous jealousy, for I have espoused you to one man that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Mashiach. So it's so beautiful. That's so that Yah came in the flesh in Yahushua and had to die for us so that we could renew that covenant, we could be remarried to him. Um because otherwise if, if Yah took us back, it would have been an abomination according to according to this command. Verse 5. When a man has taken a new woman, he shall not go out to war, neither shall he be charged with any business, but he shall be free at home one year and shall cheer up his woman which he has taken. I think we looked at this last week. Um about the when I looked at the uh, being stay home to stay with your wife, you're married, or if you're planting a vineyard, uh, to be able to stay home. So we see that here it's about Staying home for a year with your woman. This is to honor marriage, allow a newly married couple time together. And we see Yah's compassion here and not sending a, a, a newly married man straight off to war. I see this being prophetic of when we will enter into the marriage with Yahushua and enter into the kingdom where there'll be no war for a thousand years and we'll all live in Shalom. We'll live in that millennial kingdom. So, Revelation 21, uh, I'm just reading the first three verses, I believe, but it does go on more. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. He cast him in the bottomless pit and showed him up and set a seal upon him that he should not deceive the nations no more to the thousand years should be filled. And after that, 
he must be loosened a season. And we read how later on that chapter, we read how those that are part of the first resurrection, those that last through the tribulation, will live with Yahusha in this beloved city for a thousand years in peace with no war. I see it as a beautiful picture of that. No man shall take the never of the upper millstone to pledge, for he takes a man's life to pledge. So we see that no man was to use his millstone to pledge with, and no man was to take another man's millstone uh, who he may have been, de been indebted to him. Millstones were the prominent tool used for grinding grain and wheat. Therefore, if it was taken, you were taking away a man's means of producing food and his livelihood. So again, we see yards of compassion and honor for people. Therefore, we are to respect and honor their livelihood and not taking his right away from them. So we see even if someone does owe you stuff, you shouldn't be leaving them without stuff so they cannot live. Um, we just see how important it is and how Yar is, is having that compassion on people. Yeah. Taking his bread. Amen. Yeah, we, we shouldn't be taking that from him. So verse 7. If a man is found stealing any of his brethren of the children of Yasharel and makes merchandise of him or sells him, then that thief shall die and you shall put away evil from among you. So we see the honoring of life here. This practice of selling people or human trafficking was forbidden by Yahweh. People were not to be sold as slaves. It was a decision uh, by the individual who was indebted to become someone's slave and they must have been treated as family as we've spoken of before. And we see it with the, um, when a man was to take a woman from the nations, they were to be his wife. They were not considered a slave or merchandise. Yah says that when you divorce them, they're not to be merchandise, you're not to sell them. Um, and we see this here, Yah is, is against the selling of people and, and treating people like merchandise. Ezekiel 27, 13 reads, Yavan, Tubal and Meshach, they were your merchants. They traded the persons of men and vessels of brass in the market. So we see here how this act did, uh, was prevalent in these times and was carried out by the other nations, how they would sell people as slaves. The practice of selling people was practiced by the other nations, was considered evil and worthy of death by your However, we do still this, still see this uh, today. It is carried out. There are slaves probably in all countries today. Um, I know there was talk. I remember me and Catherine when we were, I believe mean, we were traveling up to Scotland one time, and it was uh, on the radio. It was talking about how there were, you know, there were slaves, and you don't really think about it because you don't see it. But it was talking about how people were taken from these third world countries, and how they were treated like slaves. You know, mates do labor and you know treat in poor conditions and i'm sure there'll probably be a lot more of it going on these days now and uh, and yar is truly against that we should be having respect and honor for all people verse they take heed in the plague of leprosy that you guard diligently and do according to all that the priest the levayim shall teach you as i command you so you shall guard to do so here we are warned of the plague of leprosy. In Leviticus 13, chapter 13 and 14, we are given in-depth details regarding the plague and how uh, we are to act, I should say. Um, what is interesting about this verse is that we see the use of the word Shema used three times, you know, that word for God. It is emphasizing how we are to guard your commandments and then we should not receive these plagues. We see it is the Exodus 15, 26. It says, and he said, if you diligently hearken to the voice of Yahweh Hakim, and will do that which is right in his sight and will give ear to the commandments and guard all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon you, which I have brought upon the Mitzrayim, for I am Yahweh Rafaika. And we, what we'll see now is we'll see spend a bit of time just looking at leprosy because there's quite a few interesting things which I want to just bring forward. So verse 9 says, Remember what Yahweh Haker did unto Miriam, by the way, after that you were uh, come forth out of Mitzrayim. So with this account, it's referring to that time when uh, Miriam, in Numbers 12, where Miriam had spoken badly of Moshe, his actions of marrying an Ethiopian wo woman. And because of this, she became leprous. Now, 
I'm not sure if it is leprosy or another form of skin disease that affected her garments and possessions in the houses, but she had this, this plague was upon her for the way she spoke. It would appear that this was caused through what she said, you know, how she spoke. We are to remember uh, and not to speak evil of anyone. I think it's believed it's called Lashon Hara. It's, it's been spoken about in Hebrew, you know, translated as an evil tongue. We're not to speak badly of people or have that. We will bring curses and diseases on ourselves for it. James 4.11 says, Speak not evil of one another, brethren. He that speaks evil of his brethren and judges his brother speaks evil of the Torah and judges his Torah. But if you judge the Torah, you are not a doer of the Torah, but a judge. Matthew 15.10.11 says, And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand. Not that which goes into the mouth defiles a man, but that which comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. It's not they're talking about eating, um, yeah, but it's talking about the things which we say, you know, what comes out of our mouth and how we, we act. And I know you touched on that, I believe, when you were talking about your clean eating, that verse, because people like to twist that and say, you know, you can eat whatever you want. It says it's not what goes into your body. But obviously they're just... Um, you know, they're not really looking at it properly in, in, in the eyes of Yahusha there. They're just using it for their own means. So Yahusha cleanses the lepers. So it's just a few things I want to talk about here with Yahusha. So we see this in Mark chapter 1, verse 40 to 44. It says, and There came a leper to him, beseeching him and kneeling down to him and saying to him, If you will, will you can make me clean. And Yahusha moved with compassion. We looked at that before put forth his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him and he was cleansed. And he straightly charged him and forthwith sent him away. And he said unto him, see that you say nothing to any man, but go your way, show yourself to the priest and offer for you, um, offer for your cleansing those things that Moshe commanded for a testimony unto them. So we see here that after he cleanses him, Yahushua tells the man to go to the priest. This was in uh, accordance with the Torah, as offerings were to be given after being cleansed from leprosy. I've not got the verses, I'm not putting the verses up, but we see it's in Leviticus 14, 10 to 32. So we see there how, you know, in cleaning, in cleansing him, Yahushua then tells him, go and do those things which Moshe commanded in the Torah, the offerings that you are to give. So we see there uh, another example of Yahusha upholding Torah. So in Leviticus 14, we read of what is required in cleansing a leper. And this is just what I want to talk about. So I thought it was very interesting with the talk of leprosy. So 14, 4 to 7, it says, Then shall the priest command you to take for him that is to be cleansed two birds alive and clean, and cedarwood and scarlet and hyssop. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. As for the living bird, you shall take it and the, and the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop and shall dip them and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. And he shall sprinkle upon them that is to be cleansed from the leprosy seven times and shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird loose into the open field. And I believe that throughout all these, we can see Yahusha in all of these elements used. So we have the cedar wood. So, you know, could be a representation of the tree that was used uh, at Yahusha's death. We don't know what tree it was, but the fact that it's wood, you know, it's a tree. So we can see that there. Scarlet. Now, this is that word that James spoke of, the tolaf. The crimson worm when we see that with yahusha with um in that account of yahusha and his death in this word from in psalm 22 as well hyssop hyssop was a, a reedy stalk and we see it used at yahusha's crucifixion it says in john 19 29 now there was a set of vessel full of vinegar and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth so we see that they're used at his death as well and at the first pace up we see hyssop used it says exodus 12 22 and you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin strike the lintel and the two side posts of the door that is in the basin and none of you shall go out of the door of the house until the morning so 
It is used in applying that blood of the lamb to the doorpost and spiritually we apply Yahushua's blood to our hearts through our faith. So I believe that in some in these aspects we can see Yahushua in them so far. Now the last ones. It's it truly is wonderful. When you see Yahushua and all the Torah, it just really does bring it together and then um, you know it, it just shows that it's all it just all fits together and um and Yahushua is the word, he is the Torah, was made flesh, and we see him in this. So the two birds clean and alive, one of the birds to be killed with an earthen vessel. So a clean bird, you know, Yahushua was clean, he lived that clean life. So both these birds could represent Yahushua. We are told how when the Ruach descended upon uh, Yahushua, it was like a dove, you see on Luke 3.22, and one was to die in an earthen vessel. Yahushua died in a human body, which was made from the ground, from the dust of the ground we were made, and we read that in Genesis 2, 7, so you could say our bodies are an earthen vessel. And then a living bird was to be released. So after he was raised from the dead, Yahushua ascended to the Shamayins, and we have accounts of this in Luke, Mark, and Acts. We see how he ascended to heaven. You know, he's that free bird then that was released. And blood is then sprinkled to make clean, and we are cleansed from the plague of sin, you know, through Yahushua and his blood. First John 1 John 1.7 says, But if we walk in the light, as he is the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Yahushua Mashiach, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So I just thought that it was quite interesting with looking at leprosy and then seeing, you know, how Yahushua healed the lepers and, and you know, in the, um, in the, the, what was used to cleanse the leper, we can see Yahushua and all of it. And it's just uh, just thought that was wonderful to bring forward. I never thought about it until just now, but I <clears throat> also wonder if the two birds could be referring to the two criminals on the cross next to him yeah. and how, you know, one ultimately did receive everlasting life, asking to be remembered in his kingdom. No, that is uh, that's a great point as well. It's a great thing as well. I never picked up on that, but it's just, that's a very good point. It's so wonderful, isn't it? How when you do start to look into it and, and y'all gives you a different perspective or different eyes to see, you can just see so much more. You can see Yahushua and so much more. And it just all brings it together. It just comes alive. It's wonderful. No, that's a great point, James. Thank you very much. I've never, I never thought about that, but that is a great point. I say one of those, one of those died and went to Sheol and the other one ascended with Yahushua. That's a great point. Uh, verse 10 and 11. When you lend your brother anything, you shall not go into his house to fetch his pledge. You shall stand abroad, and the, and the man to whom you lend shall bring out the pledge abroad unto you. So this was another form of showing honor and respect, even to those who owed you money. The collector was not to enter into his house to collect, as it would have been disrespectful, embarrassing to the man in front of his family. You know, the man was to provide for his family and this would be telling his family that he was not able to. So again, we see that compassion uh, for people as well who couldn't, you know, who, who had got into some difficulty and weren't able to sustain their family. We see this honor being shown there. And if a man be poor and you shall not, and shall not sleep with his pledge, in any case, you shall deliver him the pledge again when the sun goes down that he may sleep in his own raiment and bless you and it shall be righteous unto you before Yahweh So the collector was not to take anything that would be required for a person to sleep and be comfortable, again, showing honor to a man's livelihood. We've seen the same before with the millstone. And we are to show mercy and compassion to all those that may be in troubled circumstances again, another manifestation of Yahweh's character. Like I said, we've seen it with the millstone. We're seeing it here now. We're not to take anything from someone so that they, you know, they don't have any livelihood and we're then condemning them really to, to death. You know, you take away someone and they're going to sleep in cold conditions or they're not going to be able to produce food. The result is going to be death. So we see how we're supposed to have compassion and honor for these people. You shall not oppress a hired servant. So this is that verse that we, we touched on before about the servant that fleed. That is poor and needy, whether he be of your brethren or of the strangers that are within your gates. At this day you shall give him his hire, neither shall the sun go down upon it. 
for he is poor and sets his heart upon it, lest he cry against you unto El Yahweh, and it be sin unto you. So we are to help those in need and not oppressed. If we do and cause them to cry out to Yahweh, he will hear and it will be sin upon us. Proverbs 22, 22 to 24. Rob not the poor because he is poor, neither oppress the afflicted in the gate. For Yahweh will plead their cause and spoil the soul of those that spoiled them. For he that has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither has he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. And we must remember that when we were oppressed in Mitzrayim, when the people were oppressed in Mitzrayim, and it caused them to cry out to Yahweh, he heard their cries and delivered them. And we see this in Exodus 2, 23 and 25, where it says that he heard the cries. So we need to make sure that we're not, you know, afflicting anybody and, and causing anybody to be crying out to Yah. So verse 16, the fathers shall not put to death, should not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. So it was common in some nations for entire families to be killed for sins of one person. Therefore, Yahweh was demonstrating his character of fairness and justice, installing responsibilities for individuals and their actions. So how does this then relate to Yahusha? We are to die for our sin. Everyone sins, and the result of sin is death. However, Yah became flesh in the form of Yahusha and lived the Torah perfectly. He took on our sins and died for us so that we not, may not die that second death. He does not prevent us from death in this life, but he prevents us from having that spiritual death and being separated from Yahweh. So we are to die in this flesh, in this in this first death for our sins. You know, Yahushua has not died so that we do not die. He died so that we would be reborn, that we would have that, we'd be born at that, re reborn at that resurrection to have that eternal life. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of Elohim is eternal life through Yahushua HaMashiach are Adonai. It's the only way that we get it is through Yahushua. And John 3, 16, 16 says, For Elohim so loved the world, he gave his Yahid, that to whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. You shall not pervert, ju uh, pervert the judgment of the stranger or the fatherless, nor take the widow's raiment to pledge, but you shall remember that you were a bondman of Mitzrayim, and Yahweh Haker redeemed you thence. Therefore, I command you this day, you to do this thing. So we are to treat all people equal in justice. Zechariah 7 9 says, Thus says Yahweh Seven Oaks, saying, Execute true judgment and show mercy on, and compassion every man to his brother, and oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, nor the stranger, nor the poor, and let none of you imagine evil against his brother in there in your heart so throughout all of these laws we are seeing the importance of remembering how we were bondmen and how we were oppressed therefore we should really be you know considerate and and compassionate to all these other people that are having these um you know that are in these circumstances that are, that are you know bondmen that are the widow that are the fatherless we really should be having compassion on all these and trying to help So verse 19 now to 22. When you cut down your harvest in your field and have forgot a sheep in the field, you shall not go again to fetch it. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless and for the widow, that Yahweh may bless you in all your work of your hands. When you beat your olive tree, you shall not go over the bros again. It shall be for stranger, for the fatherless, for the widow. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not glean it afterwards. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, for the widow. And you shall remember that you were a bondman in the land of Mitzrayim. Therefore, I command you to do this thing. So when they were harvesting, if they were to miss something during it, they were not to go back for it, but they were to leave it there. So anybody that was traveling through, anybody who was who was uh, less fortunate um, would be able to have that. You know, you don't know why in our, in our world today, you know, we don't all have the luxury of being able to harvest and do our own um you know grow for ourselves but you know if we maybe drop some money 
or something sometimes we don't know what person may be traveling and may see some of that money on the floor and and that may be a blessing to them they may have not been able to to buy some food that day and, and through that they may be able to to buy something and sustain themselves the same here if, if, if food was dropped or left behind they were not to go back for it they were to leave it there so that whoever was coming through would have that someone could be on a long journey and and need something and, and that could sustain them and um, again showing honor and compassion to them knowing that all things are by you and it is yours will not to, and we're not to long over anything that's lost really just to you know everything is at the will of your yeah before we get to 25 i i had a verse that just really summed up 24 really well <clears throat> i thought i wanted to share out of sirach or ecclesiasticus 4 1 through 10 my son defraud not the poor of his living and make not the needy eyes to wait long make not a hungry soul sorrowful neither provoke a man in his distress add not more trouble to a heart that is vexed and defer not to give to him that is in need reject not the supplication of the afflicted neither turn away your face from a poor man turn not away your eye from the needy and give him none occasion to curse you for if he curse you in the bitterness of his soul his prayer shall be heard of him that made him get yourself the love of the assembly and bow your head to a great man let it not grieve you to bow down your ear to the poor and give him a friendly answer with meekness deliver him that suffers wrong from the hand of the oppressor and be not faint-hearted when you sit in judgment be as a father unto the fatherless, and instead of a man unto their mother, so shall you be as the son of El Elyon, and he shall love you more than your mother does. Oh, amen. Amen. What wonderful verses there. It just goes in absolutely perfectly. Yeah, hallelujah. Thank you very much for that, James. That's such a great verse. That Great verses, shall I say. Um no, it really is just showing that that love and compassion we're to have on people. And really it is, it is just it's just yours character that we are to be showing and walking in. It's absolutely wonderful. How can we expect to be loved if we're not giving that love back? Amen. Amen. And um, you know, if we we don't want to be judged by Yah for the th wrong things we are doing. So why should we be judging other people as well? You know, it, it's just that it's just wonderful. Yeah. Well said, brother. Thank you very much. Uh, so now, yeah, first 25 we're in now. So verse one to three. So if there be a controversy between men and there come unto judgment that the judges may judge them, then they shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. And it shall be, if the wicked man be worthy to be beaten, then the judge shall cause him to lie down and be beaten before his face according to his fault by a, num by a certain number. Forty stripes he may give him and not exceed, lest if he should exceed and beat him above these with many stripes, then your brother should seem vile unto you. So we're even to have compassion on the wicked that are being punished, and have honor during judgment it was usual for men to die when receiving more lashings uh, therefore the number was restricted we see this uh, this compassion here and restricting it so they would not die and it's interesting that the number of chosen is 40 I, I just believe because 40 was seen as associated with trials and afflictions where we've gone over it a few times you know 40 days without food and water for yahushua moshe and eliyahu we have 40 years in the wilderness um the rains during the flood of noah for 40 days as well that, it, that the rains prevailed um so we see 40 quite an interesting number there that's used so i believe it's possible uh, by the time we got to yahusha that or even before that time that they may have moved away from this compassion and were inflicting more pain and cruelty habukuk 1 4 says therefore the torah is slacked and judgment never goes forth for the wicked compass is about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceeds. We see this this wrong this um, unrighteous judgment that goes forth, and, and y'all really just want righteous judgment. Uh, with Yahushua, it's believed that the punish that he that the punishment he would have received far exceeded this, 
as it was inflicted by Roman guards. They would not have adhered to this law from you Um so I was trying to research and, you know, I'm getting a few different numbers from places on how many wounds were inflicted. Some people believe that he would have only had the 39 or 40 because of the Torah. However, I believe it would have been more about that also as well. It was the guards that would have been uh, doing the doing the uh, the judgment on him. Um. So, yeah, so I don't know. I don't know if you've come across anything, you know, when you were talking about it the other week uh, you know with the, the video from passion to christ if you have any idea on it or come across it i'm not sure but i believe that would have been more than 40 that he would have been received in his punishment yeah i mean you see in the shroud that he was wrapped in that they believe yeah. he was wrapped in um all the the digital imaging and stuff they've done over the years <laughs> shows many more than 40 so yeah, I believe I believe I'd seen that. I believe according to that, it would have been over two hundred different wounds yeah, he would have yeah. had on him. It didn't um, seem like there was much of a, a spot of skin that wasn't scarred and torn. Yeah. No. Yeah. So again, just seeing there how really that punishment that Yahusha that he he bore for us, um, you know, by his stripes we are healed, and he had many stripes for the many sins that we committed. Um, verse four, you shall not muzzle the ox when he treads out the grain. So, again, we are to have compassion and honor to our livestock as well. You know, the muzzle, it would have prevented them from being able to eat while they worked and um, a form of cruelty uh, possibly on the animals. So, again, we see here how we're supposed to, you know, have compassion on them. Yeah, Daniel, absolutely. The Romans, they wouldn't have cared how many times they hit them. Um, and as well, I, I believe from what I was reading, uh, they would have been inflicting the pain. They wouldn't have known the judgment yet that he was to be crucified. So they would have been beating him with probably the, not caring if he died or not during those punishments. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it would have they wouldn't have cared how many times they hit him. So uh, Proverbs 12, 10 says, A righteous man regards the life of his beasts, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. So the compassion and honor is considered righteous in the eyes of Yahweh, even to our animals. Um, we're to have that compassion for them. So verse five, the brethren dwell together and one of them die and have no child. The woman of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her man's brother shall go into her and take her to him as his mother his woman and perform the duty of a man's brother unto her and it shall be that the firstborn which she bears shall succeed in the name of the brother which is dead that his name be not put out of yasharel so this again was to honor the man that died and try and keep his name alive and we see this in the book of ruth we see that verse seven to ten and if the man uh, like not to take his brother's woman then let his brother's woman go up to the gate and to the elders and say my man's brother refuses to raise up unto his brother a name in yasharel he will not perform the duty of my man's brother then the elders of his city shall call him and to speak unto him and if he stand to it and say i like not to take her then shall his brother's woman come come unto him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face and shall answer and say so shall it be done unto him that man that will not build up his brother's house and his name shall be called in Yasharel, the house of him that has his shoe loosened. So um, this would have been seen as disrespectful. Therefore, the woman would perform, uh, perform this act of uh, public shaming and then they would have been known for other community. It was really, they were to act in honor really and, and, and respect for their brother that had died in, in doing this. Um, and to help carry out that name. So verse 11 and 12, when men strive together one with another and the woman of the one draws near to deliver her man out of the hand of him that smites him and pulls forth her hand and takes him by the secret, then you shall cut off her hand, your eyes shall not pity. I, I, I do love the wording in this Torah portion. Um, for for you know for a man's uh, for 
you know, around the private area. It's, it's, it's got some very uh, good wording for it, I'd say. <laughs> um, so here we are to honour people. There was even to be honour during fighting, you know, um, the woman was not to touch a man's private area as it would have been a sign of disrespect and also defiling herself. So again, this this law there, it's just uh, this command, it's, it's again, it's about keeping this honour, even in fighting. Um, no low blows. Yeah, 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 yeah. Know where that comes from now, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, verse 13 to 15. You shall not have in your bag diverse weights, a great and small. You shall not have in your house diverse measures, great and small. But you shall have a perfect and just weight, a perfect and just measure you shall have. And your days may be lengthened in the land which Yahweh Haker gives you for all that do such things and all that do unrighteousness are an abomination unto Yahweh al -Hakeh. So here we see we are to be fair in all our transactions. We are not to, to rob or cheat people by having scales or uh, measures that are incorrect. Um, Proverbs 11.1 1 says, A false balance is abomination to Yahweh, but a just weight is his delight. Verse 11, but 16.11 um, a just weight and balance are Yahweh's. All the weights of the bag are his work. And Proverbs 20, 10, diverse weights and diverse measures, both of them are like abomination to Yahweh. So these false weights and measures are an abomination to Yah. And today we talk about uh, scales of justice. And therefore, this could have a secondary meaning of being... Um, being faithful and righteous in our judgment as well as our transactions. So we, we talk about the scales of justice and, and Yah is all about justice and, and righteous judgments. So therefore in these in these scales and these balances, we could be be seeing a picture of that as well. Now, towards the end now of this Torah portion. So remember what Amalek did unto you, by the way, when you come forth out of Mitzrayim, how he met you by the way and smote the hindermost of you, even all that were feeble behind you when you were faint and weary, and he feared not Elohim. Therefore it shall be when Yahweh Haka has given you rest from all that your enemies round about in the land which Yahweh Haka gives you for an inheritance to possess it, that you shall blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, you shall you shall not forget it. So Amalek attacked them from behind after they passed the Red Sea. You know, this would have been a time when they were fear, when they were waned and faint and weary after traveling. He did not have honor or fear Yahweh. Because of these actions and this attack uh, and the battle that followed, Yahweh instructed the people to never forget and to blot out the remembrance of this people. We see it in Exodus 17, 14 to 16. And Yahweh said unto Moshe, Write this for a memorial in a sefer and rehearse it in the ears of Yahusha. In Yahusha, I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under the heavens. And Moshe built an altar and, and called the name of Yahweh, of it Yahweh Nisi. For he said, Because Yahweh sworn that Yahweh will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So we see there how. These people attacked Yasharel. So it's believed that Amalek is a type of Hasatan or has the spirit of Hasatan. It is believed that this spirit will rise. Uh, Some said this spirit rises in every generation to attack Yah's children. They were descendants of Esau, and we know that Esau would act in the flesh by even selling his own birthright. They would have no um, regards for the Ruach. Genesis 36, 12 says, And Tima was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bore Eliphaz Amalek. These were the sons of Ada, Esau's son. Oh, Shabbat Shalom, um, Asia. Thank you for that comment. Um, so Yah instructed his people to destroy the descendants of these people as they would continue to attack and destroy the people of Yasharan. We've got some examples here. So we see it. Um, it was actually something that your wife Lee spoke about um, yesterday, I believe, on her mercy poured forth in First Samuel 30, verse 1. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that Am the Amakalim had invaded the Negev 
and Ziglag and smitten Ziglag and burn it with fire. And and as as Lee carried on with the story, they took the children, they took David's wives. Um, so we see that the Amakaleen, they were the descendants of these people. Um, Esther free, uh, Esther free one. After these things, the king Akavarash promote uh, Haman, the son of Mamedoth, the Agai, and advanced him and set him above, set his seat above all the princes that were with him. Amen. Yeah, delight in him. So Agai, the word Agai here is H91, and it means descendant or subject of Agag. And when you look at Agag, it's H19. It's the title of the Amakalesh, Amakalesh kings. So Haman, that's in Esther, was a descendant of Amalek, and his plot was to destroy Yasharal. So here we can see this Hasatan spirit working through him to try and kill as many of Yahweh's children as possible. So we can see how they would continue to come up against um, Yasharal. And we see it as well with Saul. So in 1 Samuel 15, 2, it says, Thus says Yahweh Sabaoth, I remember that which Amakalek did to Yasharal, how he laid wait for him in the way when he had come up from Mitzrayim. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both men and women, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. So Yahuwah remembers what they did to his people. And here we see through uh, um, Shemuel, he instructs Saul to destroy them. However, we read in verse 7, it says, And Shul smote the Amakalim from Shavelah unto, uh, unto you come to Shur. This is against this is over against Mitzrayim, and he took Agag, the king of Amalekim, alive. Verse 26, and Sh and Shemuel said unto El Shaul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of Yahweh, and Yahweh has rejected you from being king over Yasharel. So we see here that he was instructed to kill them all, but he kept the king alive, as well as well as many um as much cattle. So we see that Shaul was rejected by Yahuwah as being king for this transgression. So I believe that it wasn't just the disobedience uh, by Saul, but it was more as well to do with the people that he um, that he spared. It was um, because they were the Amalekites, because of what they had done, and because they had treated Moshe, the people were to be continually destroyed so that's why it was such so important and that's why i believe and um, why Saul was rejected because of the people that it was that he didn't kill because it was these amicalines the amicaline if i can say it right so finally then with this whole interaction with amalek can we see yahusha in this original altercation so exodus 17 9 through to 13 it says and Moshe said unto El Yahusha, Choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand at the top of the hill with the rod of Elohim in my hand. So Yahusha did, so Moshe had said to him, and fought with Amalek. And Moshe, Aharon, and Shur went up to the top of the hill, and it came to pass when Moshe held up his hand that Yasharel prevailed, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moshe's hands were heavy. And he took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aharon and Shur stayed up his hands, the one on the uh, on one side and the one on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Yahusha discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. So when Moshe was standing there at the top of the hill, overlooking the battle with both his arms raised, it would have appeared from down below that he was on a cross. He would have had his arms out, held up either side, so he would have looked like he was in a cross. Again, same as that serpent on the pole in Numbers 21.8. These are both pictures of Yahusha being crucified on a hill. And again, like you pointed out before, um, with those two birds here, he would have looked like he had two people either side of him as well. So we would have really seen a picture there of Yahusha. Um, while Yahusha was up on the cross of the tree, while being, um, and while we behold Yahusha and his sacrifice, we will prevail over Hasatan and sin. So we see there that when his arms were up and the people looked at him, they prevailed. And it's similar to that uh, that serpent on the pole, that nefesh on the banner. 
John 3.14 says, And as Moshe lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of Adam be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So in this account, we really can see Yahushua, even to the rock which Moshe sat on. You know, Yahushua is that rock for us. So we really can see it. So then, with um, in this Torah portion, we have seen many 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 laws but uh, the major theme that has run through this portion is honor and compassion we see it from those taken captive in warfare to the servants to the sojourner and the stranger to the widows to livestock in our business dealings we see it in words that we speak even to those who are being punished and even to our forefathers in how we are to treat the amicalethine so first Peter 3 8 says, finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering even for evil for evil, or railing for railing, but count contrawise blessing, knowing that you are with unto called that you should should inherit the blessing. So we, we really do see just so much in this Torah portion, how um just about honor and compassion. And just uh, so much to take from it. Oh, thank you very much, Nina. I hope you do have a, a lovely, a lovely uh, Sabbath today. It's been a very long one, very long start to it. But I hope you all have a lovely day. Oh, thank you very much, AJ. Yeah, so uh, quite a lot in that one, then, eh, James? It's a lot to take in. It was action packed. I love how I don't know if you could call these the the minor commandments, but you know they they also obviously correlate to those ten commandments. They just give us mm. a deeper meaning. Uh, of all of those how they tie together no they do don't they and it just shows how like it's just more than those 10 there's so many we do and like these these like helpers in in telling us how to to treat people which all they all probably could be assigned to a certain certain one of the 10 commandments in a sense couldn't they yeah um, but yeah thank you very much and and thank everybody for joining us um Oh, thank you very much, Jen. I, I do hope you all have a lovely day. Here it's uh, 25 to 6 now at night. So um, we're at the end of our Sabbath, but we've still got a bit left. Oh, thank you very much, Gene. Hope hope it was a, a blessing for you all. I really do thank you all for joining us. Um, James, is there anything you want to add at the end there? Anything you want to just add before we go? I just love these deep studies. You know, it's it's amazing what sometimes we even come up with and and see as we're just reading it along so i'm so thankful to be a part of these and, and can join you on these shabbats and really just get a deeper meaning of the, the good word no there is so much and and uh, i can imagine that there's there's many things even though this was a long study i believe there's probably things that we we've, we've we've missed as well and like you say the more you read through it the more that just appears to you um so yeah, so there'll be new things to bring out next year, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but yeah, no, they are. It's such a blessing having this opportunity just to have this fellowship with people, to be jumping to the word with everyone. Um, we do thank you all for joining us. Uh, it's been such a, a blessed day, um, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Um, oh, thank you very much. Yeah, Shabbat Shalom. Yeah, I love this these tops. Um, no, thank you very much, James. So tomorrow uh, will be a new week. So a new week means that hopefully we'll be starting tomorrow with Robert Wagner if he's um, if he's well enough on Mercy Port Fourth at nine thirty. If not, I'm sure there'll probably be uh, a repeat or a rerun of his shows. Um, so please make sure you check it out. He, he does always bring a good word forward. And yeah, Shabbat Shalom, love it. And uh, James tomorrow will be with us at um, ten o'clock Eastern with the this, this new week's best uh, half Torah portion? That's correct. I'll be doing the half Torah and the Basura. Oh, excellent. So, yeah, so a lot to, uh, to to start your day with tomorrow, to start the week with. I absolutely love it. New week, new Torah portion. Uh, and it, it really is. It really is great. So, um, yeah, so thank you all for joining us. It has been wonderful. Thank you all so much for your comments. Um, you really do make these shows so so wonderful and such a blessing it's just just uh, such a privilege to have this opportunity just to to fellowship and just talk with you 
to have that dialogue because you all bring so much and we really do love it. So with that, everybody, if you've got a chauffeur, you want to grab it. And with that, we'll get ready to see out the show. So I thank you all for joining. Yeah, pray and lift up Shell and Robert and um, and hopefully they will feel better. Thank you very much for joining us, John. Such an honor to have you with us. I uh, hope you have a great day, brother. Um, so I'll just make sure I'm ready. But with that, everybody grab your shofar. Have a wonderful day and have a great week. And I'll see you next week. So Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.